Laura raised both hands and clasped her fingers behind her golden blonde head. I have everything under control, she thought, leaning back in the leather chair. The corners of her lips lifted into a wide smile as she felt the material of her blouse stretch and begin to rub against the thin fabric. A couple of months ago, she would have worn a regular white cotton bra and probably wouldn't have felt anything at all through the thick material, but the new Laura was much more sensual. Sensual and seductive, at least that's how she felt. Laura now wore an ultra-thin satin and lace bra. She closed her eyes and imagined her next meeting with Brad Griffin, her company's largest client. I really need to take care of business, she muttered to herself. Laura began to daydream again. Hmm, she thought, maybe she should buy some new underwear, something really obscene. Anticipating a long shopping trip, Laura called her daughter. Hi, Ashley, it's Mom. Hey, Mom, guess what? I got an A in history. Oh, Ashley, this is wonderful. Keep up the good work, young lady. I know you want a car when you turn 16 next year. If you get such grades, I don't see how your father can refuse. Laura encouraged her only daughter. Really, Mom? Do you really think that Dad will buy me a car? Well, if you study well, we can put pressure on him together. We both know he won't be able to refuse us if we join forces, she told Ashley with a smile. Listen, honey, I need to stop at the mall and buy something on the way home. Could you start preparing dinner? Everything is in the refrigerator on the top shelf. Of course, Mom, Ashley answered happily, still excited about the possibility of getting a car. Are you collecting a gift for Dad's birthday? Her daughter's innocent question took Laura by surprise. Damn, she thought, I completely forgot about Harrison's birthday. On the other hand, this is a great reason to stop at a shopping center. Yes, dear, but don't tell Dad. Oh, I won't tell Mom. Um, can I ask you to add my name to the gift as well? I went a little overboard with my pocket money this week, she admitted with slight embarrassment. Of course, dear, I'll add your name too. Maybe you have some suggestions? No, not really, Mom. You've known him longer than I have, Ashley joked. Okay, young lady, keep your jokes to yourself. I'll find something good, don't worry. Damn, Laura thought as she said goodbye. It's good that she reminded me, otherwise I would have completely forgotten about the birthday of my beloved husband. Laura stood in the middle of a spacious passage while crowds of people scurried past her. What to choose, she thought looking at Victoria's Secret on one side and Frederick's of Hollywood on the other. Victoria offers better quality lingerie, but Frederick's is more slutty. Since I probably won't wear it more than once or twice, she reasoned, I'll go with something cheap and slutty. An hour later, satisfied with her purchase, Laura almost forgot about her husband's birthday again. Only when she passed by the bookstore did she remember her daughter's request for a joint gift. Damn it, get it together, she mentally scolded herself, turning and walking inside. So, let's see, she thought, what would he like? Laura wandered aimlessly around the store, looking at book titles and covers. Her husband had varied interests, from non-fiction to science fiction, from history to fantasy. Laura's eyes scanned the bookshelves, searching for the perfect gift, when one title suddenly caught her attention. A is for adultery. Adultery, she repeated to herself. She had never thought about how harsh that word was. Almost immediately the word took on an ominous connotation for her. A slight chill ran down her spine as images of dirty motel rooms and forbidden sex surfaced in her head. Why couldn't they call the book a for novel? This sounds much better, not so rough. Laura couldn't help herself, took the front copy from the shelf, and began leafing through it. Stopping at the table of contents, she quickly scanned the chapter titles. 1. The difference between men and women. 2. Two needs of women, emotional and sexual. 3. Subtleties of dissatisfaction. 4. The maybe trap. She looked through all twelve chapters, but the last one almost knocked the ground out from under her feet. 12. Is it possible to save your marriage? Almost as if it were a snake that had bitten her, Laura quickly returned the book to the shelf, grabbed the one she had her eye on earlier, and headed to the checkout. This is all? 
asked the young girl behind the cash register. It seemed to Laura that she was hardly twenty years old. Yes, she replied, rummaging through her bag for cash. What do they mean can my marriage be saved? My marriage is not in danger. She mentally rejected the very idea, continuing to look for money. Suddenly her hand froze. Laura looked at the cute cashier. No, wait, she said almost in panic. I'll be right back. Laura left the book on the counter and almost ran back to get the problem copy. Laura returned to the counter, placing the same book on adultery next to the other one she had chosen for her husband. Does she know? Laura thought, carefully watching the cashier, trying to catch at least a hint of condemnation or dissatisfaction. But the cashier calmly put both books in the bag and punched the purchase. I'll have to buy wrapping paper later, Laura thought. At this moment, she just wanted to get out of the store as quickly as possible. The twelfth chapter, like a weight on her shoulders, pressed on her as she hurried to the car. Damn it, Laura thought as she drove home, I don't think my marriage is in jeopardy. Millions of people have affairs from time to time, and nothing happens. Harrison doesn't suspect anything. He'll never know unless I tell him. But I won't do it. Still, she couldn't get the topic out of her head. I really want to read this book, but when? I can't read it at home, and I'm too busy at work. We'll have to limit ourselves to lunch breaks, she concluded. When Laura returned home, Harrison and Ashley were already sitting at the kitchen table. Hey, honey, Harrison greeted with a smile. You're just in time. Still hot. Laura picked up her plate and began helping herself to food. Everything looks great, Ashley. Thank you very much. You're making a great cook, she said, leaning over and kissing the top of her daughter's head before sitting down. Thank you, Mom. Harrison, as always, wanted to tease his wife a little, even though he knew he wouldn't get an answer. So what did you buy at the mall, huh? Sexy lingerie for your adorable husband's birthday. Suddenly Laura was overcome by a wave of guilt and shame. Yes, she bought sexy lingerie, but not for her husband. She tried her best to hide her feelings. As much as you'd like to know, she replied with a forced grin. All evening Laura tried to behave as usual, and apparently she succeeded, because neither her daughter nor her husband made it clear that they felt anything was wrong. That night, Harrison went to bed, but made no attempt at intimacy. Laura was happy about this. She didn't think she could now. She was too upset. The twelfth chapter of the book continued to haunt her thoughts. What if he does find out? Will he forgive me? She was tormented. She tried to close her eyes, but it was in vain. What if? Questions swirled in her head. The next morning everything was much the same. Laura couldn't think of anything except how her little affair might affect her marriage. Arriving at work, she pulled out a book from under the car seat. It was still wrapped in a plastic bag from the bookstore. She originally planned to leave it in the car and read only during her lunch break, but suddenly decided that maybe she could find a free moment during the day. Good morning, Laura, the middle-aged secretary greeted her. Good morning, Katie. Oh, Katie, Laura added, suddenly remembering. Do me a favor and filter my calls today, please. I have a busy day today, and I don't want to be disturbed unless it's something important, okay? Of course, Katie answered, although she thought that there was nothing special in the schedule for the day. Laura took the book out of the bag and put it on the table, then took off her jacket and hung it over the back of the chair. She looked at the ominous book. It was written by a famous psychologist and specialist in family relationships. Laura knew his name. He often appeared on talk shows and even on PBS. She was sure that this man knew what he was talking about. Laura really wanted to jump straight to Chapter 12 to find out how to save her marriage, but she decided to start from the beginning. She opened the book and saw on the first page, The Difference Between Men and Women was written at the top. She chuckled nervously, Damn, even I know that difference, she thought, trying to ease the tension. At that moment, Katie knocked on the door. Laura, here's your coffee, she said cheerfully, as she did every day, entering the office. Laura quickly opened the middle drawer of the desk and threw the book into it. Thank you, Katie, she said, taking the cup with a forced smile. In her heart, 
Laura wanted only one thing for the secretary to leave quickly so that she could continue reading. Don't forget that you have an appointment with Brad Griffin tomorrow. I thought I'd remind you today because I know you always like to dress a little sexier when you're dating him, Katie said with a wink. Suddenly, Laura felt a cold sweat run through her body. If Kathy noticed this, is it possible that her husband noticed it too? Did Katie know? Laura didn't know what to say. Should she admit that she was dressing up for Brad, or would it be better to deny everything? While she was thinking about it, Katie herself brought her out of the situation. I get it. A little innocent flirting never hurt anyone, especially if it helps keep your biggest client, right? I don't blame you. If I looked like you, I would flirt with every man who walked in here, she said as she left the office. Laura felt her handshake as she took her first sip of machine-made coffee for the day. She excitedly pulled the book out of the drawer and opened it again to the first page. She had already reached the third chapter when a knock on the door interrupted her concentration. Laura, I'm going to lunch. Should I bring you anything? Laura looked at her watch. It was 12.30. She was stunned. Where did the time go, she thought. She hadn't even looked at a single work document all day. No, thank you, Katie. I'll go to the dining room, she replied. Laura waited until her secretary left the office and then plunged back into the depths of the book. Almost every word she read seemed as if the author had written it especially for her. Each chapter opened up new knowledge for her and gave her insight into her own thoughts and feelings. How can this man, whom I have never met, know me so well? Laura thought. He seemed to know her deepest thoughts and fears. She reflected on the various reasons why people have extramarital affairs and recognized herself in several of them. Yes, she had learned a lot about herself, but she was still eager to know this wise man's secret to help her save her marriage. A few minutes after the secretary left, Laura again forgot about her hunger and plunged headlong into studying her soul, as it was described in the book. The book must be amazing, said Katie, suddenly looking into the office and startling her boss. You hardly left her side all day. Have you eaten anything? Laura should have guessed that it would be impossible to hide anything from the secretary. Katie knew everything that happened in the office. Laura put a forced smile on her face again before answering. Yes, the book is very good, she said, without showing Katie the cover. This is a book on psychology. It's always good to learn more about how people think, she explained. Well, I just wanted to say that I'm going home. See you tomorrow, Katie said cheerfully, leaving the office. Laura looked at her watch again. It was already 15 minutes past five, and she had not done a drop of work that day. She was ashamed, but she still considered it a productive day. That evening at home, Laura was in a good mood. She learned a lot about why people resort to cheating when something is missing in their lives. She only had two chapters left to read the next day. She will finish before noon. By then, she will know exactly how to make sure her husband never finds out about her little mistake. When she and Harrison got into bed that night, Laura wasn't in the mood for sex, but she felt she had to reaffirm her love for her husband. Even if he never finds out about her affair with Brad, she will always remember it. She needed to make love to him for her own sake. Wow, whose hormones are raging today? Harrison whispered with a smirk. These are your male pheromones that spread from your body, she replied, teasing him back. God, how I love you, he said. What would I do without you? His words pierced her heart like arrows. Laura wiped a tear from her eye and prayed that he would never know the truth. Luckily, his eyes were closed and he didn't notice. She looked at the only man she had ever loved and wondered how she could be so stupid. The next day, Laura couldn't wait to get back to her book. She didn't even hide it when Katie came in with her morning coffee. Again for the book, she must be really good. Can I read it when you're done? Laura looked at the secretary. I think she's already been promised to another person, but maybe after that. Katie noticed that her boss was dressed in a formal business suit and wondered if she had forgotten about the appointment. You haven't forgotten about Brad, have you? Laura completely forgot about him, about everything connected with him. She had no intention of going to this meeting, but she didn't want to explain that to Katie now. 
Later, she would just call Brad and explain everything herself. But for now, she just wanted to finish the book. She smiled at her secretary. No, I haven't forgotten. Thanks for reminding me. Just like yesterday, filter your calls, okay? Of course, Katie replied, closing the door behind her. Laura did not waste any time after taking just one sip of coffee. She again plunged into reading. She absorbed every word. By the end of chapter 11, Laura was amazed at how well the author understood human emotions and how skillfully he explained them in simple terms. This is a lesson, she said to herself. She learned a lot. Now she had a much better understanding of what brought her to the motel room and why it was so exciting for her to let Brady have sex with her. Laura took a short break and leaned back in her chair. She closed her eyes to give her tired brain some rest. Everything she learned, all the soul-searching and internal struggle, none of it could ease the pain she felt for betraying her husband and daughter. With a heavy sigh, Laura straightened up and turned to the next page. Chapter 12, Can You Save Your Marriage? She wanted to read this chapter so much, but now her hand was shaking. Now she looked at the page with anxiety. What if the answer is no? She couldn't bear the thought of losing Harrison. Of course, the author, with all his wisdom, will offer a reliable way to prevent this. Laura started reading. Is it possible to save your marriage? So far we've covered many of the pitfalls and obstacles that give some people an excuse to cheat, at least in their own eyes. We discussed the most common needs both physical and emotional, that are not being met in their lives and that cannot be met by their spouse or their circumstances. We analyzed the emotional attachments they felt to their lovers. Now is the time for the most difficult part taking full responsibility and facing the consequences of your actions. Laura continued to read, and the further she plunged into the text, the heavier her soul seemed. With each new line, she realized that the author was telling the truth one cannot avoid the consequences of betrayal, one cannot simply erase it from life as if it had never happened. You will have to admit the mistake, ask for forgiveness, and face the consequences, whatever they may be. When Laura reached the end of the chapter, the pages of the book were soaked with her tears. She closed the book, unable to read any more. Everything inside her was torn her heart, her mind, her confidence. She understood that now she would have to take the hardest step in her life. She will have to confess to her husband. Katie heard a faint sob coming from Laura's office. She knocked softly on the door. Laura, are you okay? She asked carefully. There was no answer, but Katie was sure Laura had been crying. Sighing, she opened the door slightly and looked inside. Laura sat bent over her desk, her head resting on her folded arms, her body shaking with sobs. Katie walked up to her and, showing concern, put her hand on her boss's back. Laura, dear, what happened? She asked with softness in her voice. Several minutes passed before Laura was able to compose herself enough to answer. I, I'll be okay, she said, sobbing. I just have personal problems. I'm sorry, Katie, but don't worry, I'll be fine. For the first time, Katie saw the cover of the book that had fascinated Laura so much. Her heart sank Katie immediately assumed that Harrison had cheated. More than once, she was the person to whom her friends trusted their problems with infidelity. She knew that women were usually reluctant to talk about such things, but she wanted Laura to know that there was someone nearby who was ready to listen to her. Laura, if you ever want to talk about this, don't be shy, Katie said. I'm a good listener. Laura thanked her, but was not going to tell her secretary about her problems. Instead, she decided to call her friend Valerie, her best friend since high school. Valerie always supported Laura, and she was the person Laura could talk to about everything. Katie, thank you, Laura said, still sobbing. Please give me some time to be alone. If someone calls, tell them I'll call you back later. Katie placed a box of tissues and a hot cup of coffee on the table. I'll leave you alone, Laura, but remember that I'm here if you need anything. Laura thanked her again, but most of all she was grateful for the opportunity to be alone with her thoughts. She needed to think things through. She was overcome with fear. She couldn't imagine what would happen when she confessed to Harrison. But still, she knew that she could no longer live a lie. After Katie left, 
Laura took out her phone and dialed Valerie's number. Hello, Val, it's me. Hello, friend, what happened? You sound kind of depressed. Val, I need to talk to you. I know this is sudden, but can we meet? When? Now. Wherever you say, I'll come there. Valerie instantly sensed that something was wrong and was concerned. Of course, Laura. Are you at work? Yes, but I can meet you anywhere. Okay, I'm in Arlington Hills now. Why don't we meet at that little cafe on Devon and River? It's about halfway between us. Is it convenient for you in half an hour? Great, Val. Thank you very much. See you later. Laura hung up the phone, put the book in her bag, and hurried to leave the office. I'm going to have a long lunch, Katie. If someone calls, just take a message and say I'll call you back. Laura, wait. What about the meeting with Brad? Katie asked, but Laura had already run out the door. Katie tried to catch up with her, but Laura had already gotten into the car. Damn, Katie said out loud, this is a bad sign. Around 11 in the morning, Laura parked outside the cafe and took a deep breath, trying to calm down before meeting with Valerie. Going out into the garden behind the cafe, where there were several tables, Laura felt great joy when she saw the smiling face of her friend. Laura leaned over and hugged Valerie tightly before sitting down at the table. Thank you for coming, Val. Laura, what happened? You sounded like something was urgent. Laura took the book out of her bag and put it on the table. Val, I, I did something terrible, she said with difficulty, barely holding back tears. Valerie looked at the book, but still didn't understand what Laura was trying to tell her. Val, I cheated. Cheated on Harrison, Laura burst out, and tears rolled down her cheeks again. Valerie's face instantly showed disappointment and condemnation. Her voice became harsh. You, I can't believe it. Laura, how could you? She asked indignantly. Laura shook again, feeling her friend's disappointment. I don't know, she whispered, slowly shaking her head. This book explains almost every human emotion and even more. This person knows what people think, what they feel, and how they act. He can give you a million reasons why people do what they do. I read every word, but I still can't believe I did it. Oh, I can tell you why the book says I did it. I just can't believe it myself. Once the initial shock wore off, Valerie saw her friend's suffering and pain. Okay, okay, she said, reaching out and gently patting Laura's arm. Are you still dating this man? No. Well, I was supposed to meet him today, but I won't go. I'm going to tell him I don't want to see him anymore. This is at least a step in the right direction. Who is he? Does Harrison know him? No, he is our client. Harrison had never met him. God bless. If you cut off all relations with him, maybe Harrison will never find out. Val, I wanted to talk to you because, well, the book says that the best chance of saving my marriage is to confess. Confess? To whom? Harrison, are you crazy? This will kill him. He will never forgive you, Laura. You can't, I know, but according to the book. Forget about this book. Think about what you are talking about. God, if Harrison doesn't know anything, just pray he never finds out and carry on with your life as if nothing happened. Damn, Laura, think about what this will do to your family, how it will affect Ashley. Val, I think about my family. God, I'm scared. I know what can happen, I can lose them. I understand that, but the book says that it is secrets that destroy families. Val, treason is deception and betrayal. This destroys trust. How can I win back his trust if I continue to hide and lie? Openness and honesty is the first step to regaining his trust. She took a tissue from her bag and wiped her nose. I know what I need to do, Val, but I've never been so scared in my life. I'll have to tell him, but how can I hurt the person I love so much? It will be hard for Ashley, too. I was so stupid and selfish when I decided to have fun, but now I have to think about my family. They come first for me, Laura said, wiping her eyes again with a napkin. I wish I had thought about them before I slept with Brad. I don't know what to tell you, Laura. It sounds like you've already made up your mind, and when you talk about it like that, it seems like it's the right choice. It's just, God, you're risking everything. 
At that moment, the waitress came to take their order. After she left, Valerie remembered another cheating story. I don't think you've ever met my cousin Marilyn, have you? No, I heard you talk about her, but I've never met her, Laura answered. Well, her husband cheated on her, and she divorced him. He begged her to forgive him, but she couldn't. A couple of years later, we were talking, and she admitted that she didn't think it would hurt so much if she didn't love him so much. How did she find out about the betrayal? Laura asked. Oh, well, yes, he, of course, didn't admit it himself. He slept with one of her best friends. A mutual friend gave them away. They continued dating when she found out. The fact that it was her friend made everything so much worse. How long did you have it? About two months. Well, if we talk about sex, I've known him for several months. Two months? Just? I don't know, Laura. If you've only been with him for two months and Harrison doesn't know him, what are the chances that he'll ever find out? I understand, but what if he does find out? What if someone saw us leaving the motel together or someone heard Brad bragging to his friend? Can I take the risk? I don't want to lose my husband, Val. I can't lose him. I think I'll die without Harrison. No, you won't die. You may sometimes feel like you want to die, but you will survive. Don't forget, you still have a daughter. They both fell silent as the waitress brought their food and refilled their coffee. Both women needed a break from their conversation and ate a little. Halfway through the meal, Laura's phone rang. She looked at the display and saw that it was Katie. This is from work. I need to answer, she said, pressing the answer button. Hey, Katie, what's wrong? Laura, Brad Griffin called and looked for you. He sounded annoyed. I tried to remind you before you left, but you ran out too quickly. Sorry, Katie. I'll call. She was suddenly interrupted by a second call. Katie, he's calling me now. I'll call you back later, she said. Katie was shocked to learn that Brad had Laura's personal number, but before she could ask anything, Laura hung up. Katie made a mental note to ask about this when Laura returned. Hi, Brad, Laura replied, looking at her friend's stern face. Laura, where are you? Is everything okay? I've been waiting in this damn motel for over an hour. No, Brad, I'm sorry, but everything is not okay. I can't do this anymore, not now or ever. It's over, Brad. I don't want to see you anymore. There was silence on the other end of the line. When he spoke again, his confidence was gone. Laura, what happened? Have I offended you in some way? No, Brad, that's not the point. This is all wrong. We are wrong. I am a married woman with a teenager. I love my family. This should never have happened, and it will never happen again. Did your husband find out? Is he making you stop? No, Brad, he doesn't know anything. This is my decision and mine alone. Well, maybe we can at least talk about this. We've just started. No, Laura interrupted him, her voice full of determination. I'm serious, Brad. Please don't call me again or try to see me. It's over. There was no doubt in her voice, and Brad knew she wasn't joking. What a pity, he thought. He liked her body and expected their relationship to last a few more months. Well, he knew that she was married, and he understood that all this would end sooner or later. He just hoped for later. I'll wait, he thought. I'll see her at work. Perhaps later I will be able to return it. Okay, Laura, he sighed. But if you change your mind, I will. Laura ended the call before he could finish. That's it, she said, throwing the phone into her bag. What did he say? asked Valerie. Nothing special, just that he'll be there if I change my mind. Yes, you said that he is a client. Don't you think he might try to blackmail you? Threaten to end the business relationship if you don't continue sleeping with him. Don't think. He needs us no less than we need his business. Besides, it doesn't matter, Val. Of course not. Especially if you're going to tell Harrison. Valerie sighed. I don't envy you, darling. I wouldn't want to be in your place. Her heart went out to her friend, with whom she had been friends for twenty years. She reached across the table again and took Laura's hand in hers. Can I help you with something? Val asked. Laura's eyes never stopped watering throughout their conversation. She squeezed her friend's hand. 
Yes, you can do one thing, Laura said, looking at Valerie. Could you pick Ashley up tomorrow evening? I have some things to do. I'm going to talk to her when she gets back from school. If you arrived at five, I could be prepared to talk to Harrison when he returns at six. I don't know how he'll react, but I don't want him to hold back because of Ashley. He will need to talk it out. Yes, it will be hard for Ashley, but I think it's the right thing to do. Of course, dear, Valerie replied. But you're not going to tell Ashley everything, are you? Val, she's part of the family. She will suffer just like us. She has the right to know the truth. Laura, are you sure she needs to know everything? This is a difficult conversation for a teenager. I know Val, but I can't hide it from her. This concerns her life as much as ours. She deserves the truth, even if it hurts, Laura replied, wiping her eyes again. I just wish I had thought about her before all this happened. I'll be there, Laura. Don't worry. You're brave, but I still don't envy you. I don't know how I could do what you're going to do, Valerie said, feeling compassion for her friend. Laura stood up and hugged her. Thank you, she said, feeling extremely grateful. I simply have no other choice. I am fighting for the life of my family. I pray it's not too late. She paid the bill and left. When Laura returned to the office after three o'clock, Katie met her at the entrance. Laura, I'm sorry that I left you so abruptly. I had an urgent matter. Did anyone else call besides Brad? No, just him, Katie answered, but couldn't resist asking the question that was tormenting her. Laura, why does Brad have your personal number? Laura exhaled. Katie, wait until tomorrow. I'll tell you everything. I have a lot to do now and I need to work. I'll be in the office. Just let me know when you go home. Two o'clock arrived and Katie knocked on the office door, announcing that she was leaving for the day. Laura left shortly after her. That evening Laura looked at her family with special warmth. She watched Harrison and Ashley with a new depth of awareness of what she could lose. This was the last evening when her family could be happy as before, and Laura knew it. Tomorrow everything will change. She stood in the kitchen doorway and watched as Harrison helped Ashley with algebra. With angelic patience, he explained every mathematical formula. Laura smiled at their conversations. I wonder if it comes down to divorce, who will Ashley choose, she thought. She will probably stay with her father. Perhaps this will be fair. Laura thought she deserved it, but the thought was unbearable. If this really happened, she didn't know how she could survive it. What then will be the meaning of life? She searched her head for other ways, but all her thoughts led to one conclusion. Secrets would destroy the family. Maybe Valerie is right. What are the chances that Harrison will ever find out? Maybe I can just move on as if nothing happened. Let it remain my dirty little secret. And then this word appeared again, secret. Secrets, according to the book, destroy trust and relationships. Unable to bear her own thoughts any longer, Laura turned and went into the bathroom. Honey, I'm going to relax in the hot tub for a while, okay? She said, trying to calm her voice. Of course, honey, Harrison responded. Yes, Mom, don't rush. We'll still be doing algebra for at least an hour, Ashley teased. As Laura plunged into the hot water, she finally allowed herself to let out all her emotions. She prayed that no one would hear her sobs. That night she again felt the desire to be intimate with Harrison, but he did not take the initiative. Laura did not insist. Instead, she simply hugged him, lying next to him. I love you, Harrison, she whispered. I love you too, darling. Good night, he replied. The next morning, Laura greeted Katie at the office as usual. Good morning, Laura, Katie said, putting the coffee on the table. Without a book today? Thanks for the coffee, Katie. Yes, no book today. And Katie, I need two hours of complete peace. This morning, no calls or visits, okay? Of course, Laura, Katie replied, sensing something unusual in the boss's behavior. A little later, around 11, Laura invited Katie into her office. Hi, Katie, Laura said, looking up, her eyes red from crying. Sit down, please. Katie began to worry. Her boss looked depressed, as if something serious was happening. Katie, 
Yesterday you asked why Brad had my personal number. I've been cheating on Harrison with Brad for the last two months, Laura said quietly. Katie, although she suspected something like this was going on, was stunned by the confession. Oh, Laura, how is that possible? She said, shocked. I'm afraid it's true, Laura confirmed sadly. Before I bought the book, I thought it was an innocent affair, but now I understand that there is nothing innocent about cheating. Laura, I don't know what to say. There's nothing to say here, Katie. That's my fault. I have to fix it. Laura handed Katie two envelopes. These letters are a confirmation of two emails I sent to the corporate office. The first is my resignation letter. Laura, no, Katie screamed, not believing her ears. Laura raised her hand to stop her. The first letter is my statement. The second is a recommendation for your promotion to my position. I, but I'm just. Yes, exactly you. You were Mr. Bearster's secretary before me. You helped me take his place. You know how to run this office better than me or him. But why, Laura, why must you leave? Because if I continue to work here, I will have to continue to contact Brad. And if I want to save my family, I can't allow it. She took a deep breath. I removed all the important things. There should be no urgent tasks today. But be prepared that the corporate office may start calling when they run out of lunch. Oh, by the way, Laura opened her desk drawer and took out a piece of paper. Here's a brilliant recommendation I wrote for you. I hope you never need it, but have it just in case. She put the paper back in Katie's folder. Katie was touched and devastated by Laura's departure. Laura, I... I don't know what to say. Are you sure you should leave? Katie, I made the stupidest mistake of my life. My ego and desire to feel special led me to a terrible decision. Because of this, my loved ones will suffer. All I can do now is try to start the recovery process, and that starts today. The tears in Katie's eyes rivaled Laura's. Both women stood up and hugged each other. Good luck, Katie. Please send these letters today. The corporate office will want confirmation. I'll send it, she answered through tears. Laura, I don't know what prompted you to do this, but I've always respected you. Please take care of yourself. I'll try, Laura nodded. She looked around her office again and said, Now it's all yours, my friend. With these words, Laura left the office forever. Katie sat heavily in the leather chair, trying to comprehend what was happening. As she reached for some tissues, she noticed something in the trash bin, a box from Fredericks of Hollywood. Her curiosity got the better of her. She carefully pulled out the box and opened it. The box contained underwear that surprised her to the core. Katie would never have thought that Laura could wear something like this. But again, she would never have thought that Laura was capable of treason. It seems we all have a dark side, Katie thought as she closed the box. The phone rang, and it brought her back to reality. Thus began a new chapter in her life. Laura returned home a little after noon. She stood in the hallway, not knowing what to do. Her thoughts were empty, and she felt lost. There were three hours left before Ashley arrived. Laura was afraid to be left alone with her thoughts. She went to the kitchen, pouring herself a cup of the remaining coffee. She sat and silently looked into space, thinking about the upcoming conversation. A difficult test awaited her. Mom, are you home? Laura suddenly heard her daughter's voice, which pulled her out of her thoughts. She looked at her watch and was amazed it was already after three. She was overcome with fear. She froze in place her body tense and her thoughts fading when she saw Ashley standing in the kitchen doorway. Laura felt tears welling up in her eyes, but she couldn't move to wipe them away. Mom, what happened? Are you sick? Ashley asked worriedly. Laura slowly came to her senses, forcing herself to answer. No, dear, I'm not sick, she said, finally wiping away her tears. I have bad news. Is it something with Dad? Did something happen to him? Ashley interrupted with fear, her eyes widening in fear. No, honey, your dad is fine, Laura immediately reassured her. It's about your mom. I did something bad, very bad, and I need to talk to you about it. Ashley felt relieved. She thought that something truly terrible had happened, something irreversible.
but if it has to do with her mom, how serious can it be? Mom, you scared me. Can I have something to eat before we talk? I'm terribly hungry. Of course, dear, Laura agreed, grateful in her heart for the short break. With teenage dexterity, Ashley made herself a sandwich and poured a glass of milk. She sat down next to her mother at the kitchen table and began to eat. Well, Mom, what did you want to say? Laura stood up and put the cup of iced coffee in the microwave, trying to buy some more time. I'll wait until you're done, honey. What I have to say requires your full attention. Ashley was surprised by the seriousness in her mother's tone. She quickly finished her sandwich and drank her milk. That's it, I'm done. Let's go to the living room, dear. It will be more comfortable there, Laura suggested. They both settled down on the couch, facing each other. Laura took a deep breath, trying to collect her thoughts. Darling, I did something terrible, and I'm afraid it will cause you and your father a lot of pain. I cheated on your dad. At first, Ashley didn't understand what her mother meant. Changed, she asked herself. Then it dawned on her. Her mother started an affair with another man. She couldn't believe it. What do you mean, Mom? Are you saying you slept with another man? Ashley asked, her eyes already filled with tears. Yes, dear, I'm afraid that's exactly what I mean, Laura barely said, choking with shame. How could you, Mom? How could you do this to Dad? Ashley screamed, sobbing as tears rolled down her cheeks. I'm sorry, Laura stammered, hugging her daughter. I'm so sorry that I'm hurting you. They hugged and Ashley clung to her mother's shoulder, sobbing, as both women couldn't stop crying. Several minutes passed before they released their embrace. Laura wiped her tears with a napkin and handed one to her daughter. Mom, how could you do this? I don't understand. You love Dad. How could you do this to him? Ashley asked, still sobbing. It's hard to explain, dear. I bought a book that tries to explain how this can happen. But even after I read it, I don't fully understand how I could do it. I can tell you what it says in the book. My promotion at work made a difference. I worked hard for many years to achieve this position, and when I finally became a manager, it gave me a sense of achievement. Unfortunately, it also made me feel like I deserved better, that I have the right to enjoy the fruits of my success. Laura grabbed a new napkin to continue. The book says that this is one of the most common reasons why successful men cheat on their wives. It's a way to transfer a sense of power and control from work to your personal life. I probably felt something similar. Ashley sobbed and hugged her mother's hand. I won't tell Dad, don't worry. I won't tell anyone, she whispered. Darling, this is not a secret we can keep from your father. I have to tell him. No, you can't. Mom, you can't tell Dad. He will divorce you. You know he will do it. Please don't tell him. Ashley screamed in despair, again throwing herself into her mother's arms and bursting into tears. Laura's heart was torn into pieces. Why did she make such a terrible mistake? Darling, I did a terrible thing, and now I have to try to make things right. But Mom, honey, if Dad ever finds out for himself... It will hurt him even more than if I tell him about it now. And if this happens, how can I convince him to stay with me, knowing that I not only cheated on him, but also hid it? Oh, Mom, I'm so scared, Ashley cried. Dad will leave us, I know that for sure. Laura hugged her crying daughter. She wanted to tell her that this would never happen, that her dad would never leave them. But she knew that the reality was that he could very well leave. Honey, if it comes to the point where one of us leaves, then most likely it will be me, Laura said, brushing her daughter's damp hair out of her face. No, Mom, I don't want you to leave either. I want us all to stay together. I know, I know, darling. I'll try, I'll do my best, but I can't promise you that it will work out. Laura tried to comfort her daughter with gentle touches until Ashley cried all her tears again. When she finally calmed down a little, it was almost five o'clock. Ashley, I'm so sorry this isn't fair to you, but I have to ask you to be brave for me. I'm going to talk to your father when he gets home today. As much as it's hard for me to do this, I think it's better if you're not here when I do it. No, Mom, please don't send me somewhere, Ashley begged. Honey, I'm not sending you away. 
I asked Mrs. Collins to look after you for one night only. You'll be back tomorrow, I promise. Mom, can I stay? Honey, when I tell this to your father, he will be very angry. He will need to vent his anger, and I'm afraid he won't be able to do that if you're at home. Please try to understand me. I'm so sorry that everything turned out this way. Okay, Ashley replied, wiping her nose again. I'll go upstairs and pack my things. Laura watched as her brave daughter walked up the stairs. A few minutes later, she heard a knock on the door. It was Valerie. Hello, Laura greeted, letting her friend in. How did it go? Valerie asked in a quiet voice. Laura sighed. About as I expected. The poor girl is completely broken. Val, if I survive this, I'll probably write my own book. I want to warn every woman about what it feels like to betray your family, the people you love the most. You know, Laura, this isn't such a bad idea. Maybe this will be some kind of therapy for you. And who knows, maybe you can even make money from it. At that moment, Ashley came down the stairs with a bag. Hello, Mrs. Collins, she greeted. Hi, Ashley, Valerie replied. We're having fried chicken for dinner today. Both women found it difficult to look at Ashley's sad face. Thank you, Laura said to her friend. She looked at her daughter, whose face was full of grief. I know it's hard, but try not to worry too much, honey. Your father is a fair man, and he loves us very much. I love you, Mom, Ashley said, hugging her mother. On the way to the car, she turned to her again with a plea in her voice. Mom, please don't tell Dad I'm afraid. I don't want you to divorce him. Darling, please understand. This is our only chance to become a real family again. They said another tearful goodbye, and Laura watched as the car containing her daughter and best friend drove out of the driveway. She sank heavily onto the first step of the stairs leading up. She needed to get herself together. The thought of her daughter packing for the night got her thinking, maybe I should pack too. It might not be a bad idea if Harrison puts me out, she thought. Laura went upstairs and packed for a few days, then hid the suitcase under the bed so her husband wouldn't see it. Looking around, she saw her bag on the dresser. She looked at the time on her mobile phone. It was 15 minutes to 6. In another 15 minutes, Harrison will enter the house. Laura took the book from her bag and went downstairs with it. Almost in a trance, she went to the kitchen and made fresh coffee. She couldn't wait for all the coffee to brew and, with a trembling hand, poured herself a cup. She looked at the wall clock. Ten minutes to six. Laura sat down at the table, her heart pounding in her chest and her eyes sparkling with tears. Hello, dear, I'm home, she heard her husband's voice when he entered the house. She tried to tell him where she was, but no sound came out of her throat. Her hand shook again as she raised it to her face and began to cry again. As soon as Harrison saw what was happening, he hurried into the kitchen to join his worried wife. Darling, what happened? He asked excitedly. He had never seen her like this. Suddenly, he realized that he had not seen or heard Ashley. He was overcome with anxiety. Did something happen to Ashley? Was she hurt? Laura just shook her head and, sniffling, weakly said, no, no. Ashley is fine. She spends the night at Val's. At Val's, darling, he said, kneeling down next to her and patting her shoulder. Please try to calm down and tell me what happened. She was on the verge of a breakdown. Please, just give me a minute, she begged, wiping her eyes. How about you grab some coffee and sit down? I need to tell you something, she added, sobbing. Harrison respected her request. After another gentle, reassuring touch on her shoulder, he nervously walked over to the countertop, pulled out a mug from the cabinet, and poured himself some coffee. When he returned to the table and sat down next to his wife, she calmed down a little. Harrison, I love you and Ashley more than life itself. I can't imagine what I'll do without you too, but this love hasn't stopped me from doing something really stupid that I'm really ashamed of and I can only hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me, she said, finally looking into his eyes. Harrison sat looking at his beautiful wife with a very puzzled expression on his face. He didn't understand what she was leading to. Harrison, I cheated on you. I had an affair with another man, she said. 
Her voice was still weak from crying, and Harrison thought he had misheard. He froze when he saw his wife's frightened face and realized that he had heard everything correctly. His loving wife cheated on him. It seemed as if a cold fog suddenly enveloped him. He couldn't speak. He couldn't think. He kept hearing his wife's words echoing in his head. Laura tried to predict how he would react, but so far he hadn't even moved. Harrison, Harrison, please say something, she begged. What? What do you want me to say, he said, just starting to come out of his daze. What should I say? Oh, I know, maybe, don't worry, honey. Or better yet, maybe, hey, let's have a threesome, Fury began to boil in his voice. Or, or maybe, wow, can I watch, he shouted. Suddenly, in one motion, he stood up and threw the mug at the wall with such force that it broke into a thousand pieces, sending coffee flying all over the room. Laura shuddered and ducked. She expected him to be angry, but in all the years of their marriage, she had never seen him so aggressive. Damn you, Laura. Go to hell, he shouted, turning to the exit. Wait, Harrison, please don't leave. We need... The slam of the front door interrupted her desperate plea. She thought she couldn't cry anymore, but new tears flowed from her red, swollen eyes. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Harrison's thoughts literally screamed in his head. He quickly walked past his car and turned left along the sidewalk without thinking about where he was going or in what direction. All he knew was that he needed to get out of the house and he wasn't in the mood to drive. It will also crash into a pole or something similar. Damn, his thoughts continued to rage. How could this happen? He asked himself a question. Have I been a bad husband? Bad father? Wasn't I a good provider? His body was tense, his breathing uneven. He had already walked three blocks at a brisk pace. He needed to calm down, otherwise. Otherwise, damn, he told himself. I wish someone would look at me the wrong way, then I could punch someone. It had been almost three hours since Harrison left. After Laura had cried all her tears, she swept up the broken pieces of the mug and was on her knees, wiping off the sticky coffee when she heard the front door open. She looked up to see Harrison come in and plop down on one of the kitchen chairs. I was worried about you. Are you okay? She asked. Were you worried about me? There is no need to say such nonsense. I don't want to hear it. If you really cared about me, you wouldn't end up in bed with someone else. Well, now you can worry about your lover. Harrison, please listen to me. Okay, speak up. Although I don't know what to talk about here. You said everything you need to say. You made it clear. You are sleeping with another man, and that's it. For me, the story is over. Harrison, please listen to me. Do you love him? he asked without looking at her. Oh, Lord, no, no, I don't like it at all. I hardly know him. Is it true? He said sarcastically. You slept with him. You had sex with him. I'd say you know him pretty well. Who is he? Do I know him? No, no, you don't know him. I met him at work. He is one of our major clients. Yet, so if you don't love him, then what is it? A way to keep his business. Are you now a corporate woman of easy virtue? His harsh words pierced her soul. She wanted to cry again, but she couldn't. She had to at least try to talk to him. No, Harrison, that's not the point. Please listen to me. I was stupid and selfish, but it's over. I quit today, never to see him again. This caught his attention. Did you quit your job? Yes, I also changed my phone number. I needed to prove to you that it was all over. I will never see or hear from him again. I knew I needed to cut all ties, and if that was what it took, it was a small sacrifice to prove to you how serious I was. Are you serious? What a joke, he muttered. And what are you going to do to support yourself? I don't know. Now I don't care. The only thing I care about is saving our marriage and saving our family. Well, that's unlikely. I can't live with a cheater, Laura. You must understand this. Yes, yes, I know, she said, lowering her head. Laura got up from the floor and sat on the opposite side of the table from her husband. Harrison sat motionless, staring into space. Harrison, I know how this sounds, but I'm so sorry. Yes, I know, it was just a big mistake. You won't let this happen again, right? He said mockingly. 
What's his name, by the way? She remembered that the book taught her not to make excuses, to explain honesty and answer all his questions. His name is Brad Griffin, and unfortunately, it's not a mistake, Harrison. Mistakes are made when people do wrong because they don't know better. I knew I was doing the wrong thing. We both know it. No, it was selfishness and arrogance. I worked so hard to get to the top of the company that when I did, I felt like I was owed something. I thought that life owed me for my efforts. He was flattering and charming, and I allowed myself to believe that he was my prize. It was the worst decision of my life, and I will regret it for the rest of my life. Harrison lowered his head and began massaging his temples. His head was starting to hurt. He needed coffee. Maybe this time he'll drink it. He felt lost in his own home as he stood up and poured himself a cup. Everything he held dear in life seemed to be falling apart around him. This morning he was a strong, confident man with a loving wife and a beautiful daughter. Now he doubted himself as a man, and his loving wife turned out to be not so loving at all, but the worst thing was that his precious daughter suffered the most. He wasn't stupid. He knew how the courts worked. He was confident that his wife would receive full custody in the event of a divorce. How will this affect his relationship with Ashley? Have they always been this close? He stood at the countertop, sipping coffee and looking out the window. He just couldn't understand how this could happen. He turned to the woman he had always loved more than life itself. I'll go upstairs and pack my things. I'll talk to a lawyer tomorrow. Although it didn't come as a surprise to her, her heart still sank in pain at the mention of the lawyer. No, Harrison, if one of us has to go, it will be me. I packed my things earlier in case you kick me out, she admitted sadly. Is it true? And where will you go? I don't know. Probably to a motel. Yeah, and how are you going to pay for it? He answered. You don't have a job anymore, remember? Don't know. I'll have enough money for a cheap motel for a while. What will happen after, for a while? Do you think you'll come back when your money runs out? Even cheap hotels cost $50 to $60 a night, and they are not very safe for a single woman. Besides, we can't both be unemployed. I still need to work, and Ashley will need someone to be there. No, I'll pack my things and leave as soon as possible, he said, anger still evident in his voice. Harrison, please wait at least one more day so your daughter can see you before you leave. She needs your reassurance that you still love her, that you are still her dad. Please, I'll sleep in the guest bedroom. Ashley was the only card she could play and win. What does she know? He asked. Everything. Well, except for the details, of course, but I told her what I did, Laura explained. For what? Why did you do this? Was it really impossible to say that we just had a quarrel? She's our daughter, Harrison. This will affect her as much as it affects us, maybe even more. She has the right to know the truth, Laura answered sadly. Her argument was logical. It didn't take long for Harrison to concede. Okay, he sighed. I'll come home after work tomorrow to talk to her before I leave. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you very much. I'm not doing this for you, but for her he responded sharply. Laura looked at the man who had always been her support, the man with whom she always felt safe. The anger was obvious, but underneath it was pain. She saw it in his eyes, read it in his behavior. He was slightly hunched over, his shoulders slumped and his head drooped. He seemed to have aged ten years in the last three hours. Laura couldn't remember ever in her life hating someone as much as she hated herself at that moment. There was no other word for it. Harrison, I understand that I have no right to ask you for a favor, but could you do me a favor? A favor? He grinned. You haven't lost your impudence yet, that's for sure. Okay, what do you want? Would you like me to set you up with someone I know? Laura knew that he was trying to prick her, just as she had pricked him, but his words still pierced her heart like a dagger. She had never seen him in such pain, and the knowledge that she herself was the cause of it only added to her suffering. Harrison, this is a psychology book that explains cheating. She helped me realize a lot. I'd like you to read it. I? For what? I'm not the one who cheated, he answered with irritation. I know, Harrison, 
but it explains the reasons why people get involved in affairs, and there can be many of them. It talks about human vulnerabilities. Yeah, and you think there's something there that will make me forgive you? Forget it, Laura. No, that's not the point. Please, Harrison. I'm not trying to make excuses, but at least you will understand that my cheating had nothing to do with your ability to be a good husband or lover. This will help you see that it is my fault, not yours. It's not your fault. Please, she repeated, holding out the book to where he was sitting. I'll go take a shower, he said, finishing his coffee. Then I'll move things to the guest room for tomorrow. You can stay in the bedroom. I don't want to sleep in this bed anymore. His words again hurt her to the core. What about dinner? Laura asked. I'm not hungry, he answered, walking past the table and leaving the book where it was. No one slept that night, not Harrison, not Laura, not Ashley. Laura heard Harrison start moving around the house an hour before the alarm was supposed to go off. She thought about making him breakfast, but knew that if he was up so early, it meant he didn't want to see her, and she had to respect that. She needed to give him space and time to figure things out. She lay in bed, listening, imagining what he was doing, and praying that this wouldn't be the last time she heard him getting ready in the morning. When she heard the front door slam shut, she thought her heart stopped. Laura knew she wouldn't be able to sleep, so she got up, put on her robe, and went down to the kitchen. She hoped Harrison had taken the book with him, but it was still lying on the table where she had left it. Laura felt empty inside as she mechanically prepared breakfast. By the time she finished her first cup of coffee that day, she had already asked herself several times whether she had done the right thing by telling the whole truth. She sat, staring blankly at the wall, searching for some hint of her future. She needed to look for a new job, whether Harrison stayed with her or not. The thought of Valerie's proposal to write a book also flashed through her mind. At first it sounded funny. Apart from a few school essays, she never wrote anything serious. But the more she thought about it, the more she liked the idea. Even if no one publishes it, it could be therapy for her. It was something worth thinking about. Laura was so deep in thought that the ringing of her home phone made her jump. It wasn't yet 8.30, and she knew it could only be one person. Hey Val, how's Ashley? How did you know it was me? Valerie asked in surprise. Who else could call me this early? How is she? Ah, well, she cried almost all night. I didn't send her to school. I think it would be useless. She needs to be with you. Yes, I agree. Let me take a shower and I'll come get her, okay? Certainly. She's still in bed, but I'll start preparing breakfast and tell her you'll be arriving soon. She really needs to be with you. Okay, thanks for taking her, Val. My pleasure. So how did it go for you? Not good. He was going to leave yesterday, but I talked him into coming back after work tonight to talk to Ashley. Val, maybe I should have listened to you and not told him. You should have seen him. I hurt him so much. All I wanted to do was hug him, but of course I couldn't. I caused so much suffering, first to Ashley, then to Harrison. It was the hardest experience of my life, but for them it was even worse. You know, if it's any consolation to you, after our conversation I changed my mind about whether to tell Harrison. I think you were right to tell him. A marriage should not be built on lies, and if you remained silent, it would be just such a lie, a lie through omission. No, I think you made the right choice. I'm not sure about Ashley, but I know you do what you think is right. I hope everything works out for you. Thank you, Val. It means a lot to me. If I arrive around 9.30, Will that be okay? Yes, answered Val. It will do. Laura struggled to get into the shower. She hoped the hot water would calm her nerves, but it had no effect other than washing away the traces of tears. Before Laura left, she remembered the book lying on the kitchen table. She still hoped that she could convince Harrison to read it. He was right, of course. There was nothing about her that would make him forgive her. But if he realized how many human emotions were involved, Maybe he would at least stop hating her. Laura took the book and put it on her dresser. As soon as Laura entered Valerie's house, Ashley rushed to her and hugged her tightly. Laura hugged her close, hugging the girl's head with her hand. What did he say, Mom? What did Dad say? Ashley asked, 
her eyes filling with tears again. Laura looked at her friend sitting on the sofa for advice, but a slight shake of Valerie's head made her understand that she should not wait for advice. How could she tell her daughter? What words could she use to somehow ease the pain Ashley would feel when she realized her father was going to leave? Obviously, there were no such words. Honey, your father was very upset and angry. I honestly don't know what's going to happen next, but he said he was going to move out. She felt Ashley begin to cry harder. Darling, you will still see him. I am sure that your father will not go far, and I will never limit your communication. Remember, he's angry at me, not you. Harrison was sitting at the table. Something, some noise brought him back to reality. Then I realized that I had been looking at the same piece of paper for the last forty minutes and had not read a single word. His mind was in turmoil. His subconscious traveled through time, not linearly, but in a series of intermittent memories, searching for clues, for something that could explain his current plight. There was nothing. His brain switched from the past to the future. I wonder what life will be like after divorce. How will this affect my relationship with my daughter? When Harrison walked into his office that morning, he had every intention of calling a good divorce lawyer first. He glanced at the clock on his desk. It was almost noon, and he hadn't dialed the number yet. Harrison rose from his chair and walked to the third floor window. He's tired. The emotional stress he endured also drained him physically. He was confused and unsure of himself. What's wrong with me? he asked himself. He was always so confident in his judgment. Even as a small boy, he could analyze any situation that arose and use cold, hard logic to bring it to a successful conclusion. But it was illogical, and no matter how hard he tried to look at it that way, in the end, he knew the conclusion would be anything but success. Another thing he was thinking about was Ashley. He knew it would hurt her terribly if he left and divorced her mother, but somehow he had to make her understand. Ha, he chuckled to himself. How can I make her understand if I don't understand it myself? As the day grew older, Harrison became increasingly anxious. All day he didn't know what to do. It wasn't like him. He repeatedly tried to analyze things, but how to analyze the feelings of the heart? He had loved Laura for twenty years, and no matter how hurt, disappointed, and angry he was, that love wasn't going away any time soon. Harrison sighed. It was time to go home and meet his little girl. He didn't expect this. Daddy, oh daddy, Ashley shouted as she ran to the front door. She wrapped her arms around his waist and squeezed as hard as she could. Dad, I love you. Harrison hugged his daughter and hugged her back. I love you too, pumpkin. Laura watched from the kitchen doorway as a tear escaped the corner of her eye and rolled down her face. Harrison, I hope you can stay for dinner, she said, wiping away the moisture. It's almost ready. He glanced in her direction and nodded. Come on, honey, he told Ashley. Let's come and sit on the sofa. We have something to talk about. Laura returned to the kitchen to set the table and give them some privacy. Daddy, please don't go, Ashley said, sitting down next to her father. Please, Dad, forgive Mom. I know she'll never do that again. Honey, I wish it were that easy, I really do. Don't you love mommy anymore? Ashley asked. It's funny, he thought. I ask myself the same question all day. Of course he still loved her, but that love had suffered greatly. This was no longer the first thing he felt when his wife entered the room. Instead, anger, pain, and maybe a little hatred pushed that love to the background of his emotions. Maybe it would die there altogether, he wasn't sure, but somehow he needed to explain to his daughter why he couldn't live there anymore. Yes, dear, of course I still love your mother, but life as husband and wife involves more than just love, it also requires trust and respect from both people. Your mom said she told you what she did, so I won't try, to sugarcoat it. At some point I lost your mother's respect as her husband, even though she didn't mean to do it, what she did hurt me, darling. I know she's sorry, but it really won't help. Oh, Dad, she screamed. My pumpkin, he said, brushing the hair out of her eyes. I wish I could wave my magic wand and make all this go away, but I can't. 
I hope you understand, darling. I just can't go on living. It would be a constant reminder of what your mother did. It would be torture for me, my dear, I'm sorry. Tears stained Ashley's beautiful face as she nodded her head. She knew this would happen. As soon as her mom told her what she did, she knew there was no way her dad could accept it. She knew that the loving home she had known all her life was history. Harrison saw the grief on his little girl's face. He grabbed her and pulled her to his chest, his strong, fatherly arms wrapped around her small body. He felt the moisture of her tears soak into his shirt. He felt her body shake with every sob. He placed his cheek on the top of his head. I'm so sorry this happened, honey. I'm very, very sorry. None of them saw the tragic figure standing in the doorway. If only she had a crystal ball and could see all this before succumbing to Brad's charms, she thought. If she had foreseen the pain she caused her family, she would never have cheated for Brad or anyone else. If, 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 Harrison let his daughter cry until the sobs became distant from each other. Come on, honey, he said lovingly. Your mother has already prepared dinner. I'm going to have lunch with you guys before I pack up, okay? Ashley nodded her head. She wiped the moisture from her face and tried to act brave as they both stood there. Laura stood at the counter with her back to them. Her own pain was unbearable. She could only imagine the pain her husband and daughter were in. Have a seat, she said, trying to keep her voice from shaking. There were three place settings on the table, but Laura only prepared two dishes. She placed them in front of Harrison and Ashley. I, I'm not hungry, she said just before her voice cracked. I'm sorry, she said before leaving the room. Harrison looked at his daughter's New Year's. We're all having a hard time, honey, he told her. Harrison tried to distract his daughter from her thoughts by asking about school, boys, activities, everything except her upcoming death. After dinner, they rinsed the dishes together and put them in the dishwasher. I bet your mom has ice cream in the freezer, he said, breaking the brief silence. Would you like dessert? I'll get the bowls, she said, opening the cabinet door. The proud dad tried to lighten the mood as they continued talking over dessert, and at one point even made Ashley laugh a little. By the time they finished their ice cream, they both felt a little better. Harrison went upstairs to start packing. Laura was still wearing her clothes, but she was sitting at the head of the bed. He looked at the couple dozen dirty napkins scattered around her. If it weren't so sad, it would be almost funny. He reached over to take the suitcase off the top shelf of the closet and then opened it on the floor next to his dresser. I hope you only said those things yesterday to hurt me and don't actually believe it, Laura whined. What things, he replied, throwing socks and underwear into the bag. Please believe me, Harrison, I still love you. As much as ever, I heard what you told Ashley about losing respect for you. That's true, but not because of anything you did. You have always been such a kind person who deserves and receives the respect of everyone he knows. From everyone except his wife, Harrison remarked bitterly, interrupting her. No, that's not true. In all the years of our marriage, there has not been a single moment when you did not deserve my respect and love, Laura said with despair. Then why? He asked with the same anger that he had the day before. You just said you lost respect for me. Why? It happened because of false pride, Laura explained, finding it difficult to find the words. When a person is filled with pride, he begins to consider himself better than others and loses respect for others. Some people live their entire lives with this false belief that they are superior to others. But sometimes something happens that makes them face reality and realize how wrong they were. I had to face this reality when I realized that I had betrayed the people I love most in the world, my wonderful husband, our daughter, my friends, our marriage. I was so stupid and arrogant in thinking that I could do anything. But now I'm begging for forgiveness. Please tell me it's not too late, Harrison. Harrison sighed heavily, closing his suitcase. I don't know, Laura, he said, straightening up. I think I'm still in a state of shock. I... I feel empty, I feel bad from this pain. I never thought that you could do this. I don't know if I can ever forgive you. I'm not sure what I want right now, but I know one thing I can't stay in this house. 
I wish I could stay for Ashley, but I just can't. He took the suitcase and set it by the bedroom door, then went back to the closest to grab a few more shirts and pants. He went out to the car to put his things in the trunk and returned again for his suits and jackets. Everything was ready. Once the items were in the car, Harrison went upstairs to say goodbye to his daughter. He entered her room, where Ashley was already waiting for him, with a worried expression on her face. As soon as I get settled, honey, I'll let you know where I'll live, he said, sitting down next to her. We'll still see each other on weekends and maybe even sometimes in the evenings. Tears welled in his eyes as he hugged his daughter tightly. He felt her tiny arms wrap around him and knew that this was the most important thing for her right now, to feel that he would always be there, despite everything that was happening. I love you, Dad, Ashley whispered. I love you too, Harrison said with difficulty, trying to hold back his tears. I will always be your dad, and you will always be my daughter. This will never change, remember that, honey. As he turned to leave her room, he saw Laura standing at their bedroom door at the end of the hallway. She looked devastated there was no trace of her former pride or self-confidence on her face, only pain, regret, and deep sadness. They had no more words left for each other at this point. Harrison simply went downstairs and went out to the car. Come on, Laura said, raising her arms to hug her daughter. We'll go out and wave him goodbye. The two of them stood on the porch, waving after the car until its taillights disappeared around the bend. Don't lose hope, Laura said, trying to instill at least a little optimism. Harrison's first instinct was to drive to the Holiday Inn, which was a few blocks from his office, but as he pulled into the parking lot, something made him feel like it was too far, too far from his home. He needed to be close to family in case he needed Ashley. He turned around and drove to the extended stay motel, which was only a mile from their house. There he could rent a room for a long time with a small kitchen, which was useful for him. Having occupied the room, Harrison began to unpack his things. He hung shirts, trousers, and suits in the closet and put everything else on drawers and shelves in the bathroom. He didn't know what would happen next, but for the near future this motel was to become his home. While he was thinking about this, he called Ashley on her cell phone to tell her where he would be living and to reassure her that they could see each other on weekends and in the evenings. Sitting on the bed, still in his clothes, Harrison turned on the TV. But he soon realized that there was an oppressive silence in the room. This feeling of loneliness, like a demon, seeped under the door and began to take over his mind. He closed his eyes with the thought that for the first time in his life, he was truly alone. Meanwhile, back at the house, Laura was putting Ashley to bed. She had not done this for a long time her daughter was already old enough to not need it, but Laura felt that now she needed to show concern. Mom, do you really think that Dad will come back? Ashley asked as Laura adjusted the blanket. I'll do everything I can to make it happen, honey, Laura answered with a smile, although there was only pain in her heart. Later, as Laura herself was getting ready for bed, she noticed that the book she had left on the corner of the dresser had disappeared. For the first time in days, a faint smile appeared on her face. A small spark of hope lit up in her heart. Harrison woke up the next morning, still dressed. He was surprised how soundly he slept. Obviously, complete emotional exhaustion had finally taken its toll. A shower with hot water helped him come to his senses. Slowly but surely he began to feel his confidence returning. At work, he was the person everyone turned to for help. He worked for a marketing data company and served as a project manager for large clients. His personal team consisted of his assistant Dana, two secretaries, and more than 20 analysts, managers, and assistants. He rarely had to answer to his superiors because his work was always top-notch. Good morning, Harrison. Dana, the middle-aged woman who had been his assistant for the past eight years, greeted him. Good morning, Dana he answered, as always, with a smile, walking into his office. Dana, do me a favor. Print out my entire schedule for the week and bring it along with the coffee. I might want to review some things. Of course, she nodded. A few minutes later, Dana entered the office with his coffee and a printed schedule. Is everything okay? 
she asked, putting the cup on the stand. Yesterday, you practically didn't say a word to me. Harrison thought for a moment. He did not want to make his personal life public. At work, he was always collected and confident. What would his employees think if they found out that he had failed in his own marriage? But it was Dana, the person he could trust. Dana, this shouldn't go beyond this office, okay? Of course, Harrison. What's happened? Laura and I. We have problems. Yesterday I left home. Oh, Harrison, Dana responded sympathetically. It's horrible. I'm afraid so, he nodded. I'm going to see a divorce lawyer this week. So I need time for this. I'm so sorry. How's Ashley? Does she know? Yes, she knows everything. How is she holding up? Not very well, but she's great. She can handle it. I assured her that we would see each other as often as before. Harrison noticed the worry in his assistant's eyes. She was another victim of his situation. How many more people will be involved in this because of Laura's betrayal? If you need anything, let me know, she suggested. Thank you, Dana, I can handle it, he replied, looking down at the schedule she had brought. Harrison saw that he had his next few days booked up to the minute, but rescheduling one of his meetings could free up a few hours later in the week. He called Dana and asked her to make the necessary changes to the schedule. After some time, he found a lawyer he decided to choose the one who had the largest advertisement in the yellow pages. Dana made an appointment with him for two o'clock on Friday afternoon. The visit to the lawyer was a real revelation for him. Stan Gilman, a tall, gray-haired gentleman in his sixties, met Harrison in his spacious office. The secretary offered him coffee, and as soon as the politeness was observed, Stan got down to business. So, Mr. Corbett, how can I help you? Well, I, most likely, am going to divorce my wife and would like to know what will be connected with it. I understand, Stan nodded. On what grounds do you plan to file for divorce? Um, should there be reasons? Can't you just file for divorce without anyone's fault? Illinois does not have a no-fault divorce system. You can file on the basis of irreconcilable differences, which is almost like a no-fault divorce. This means that neither party is required to admit guilt. However, there are certain conditions. What are the conditions? Harrison asked, frowning. Does your wife agree to divorce? I doubt it, Harrison replied, shaking his head. In this case, you will have to live separately for two years before you can apply. Two years? Harrison was indignant, almost falling out of his chair. This is madness. Perhaps, Stan said calmly, but that's the law. Now, if you file for a fault-based divorce, you can file immediately. Does your wife suffer from addiction? Did she cheat? Left you for a year or more? Have you committed physical or mental violence? Stan leaned forward. Why do you want a divorce, Mr. Corbett? She cheated on me, Harrison finally admitted. It's clear. Do you have evidence? Yes, she told me about it herself. She confessed. Is it true? Well, I guess she confessed because she was going to leave for her lover. Are you sure she doesn't want a divorce? No, she promised not to see him again. Moreover, she quit her job because he was her client. She confessed to me to ease her conscience. I understand, Stan answered. He suspected that there was more behind Laura's confession than just a desire to clear her conscience, but that's none of his concern. His job was to represent the client's interests, not to understand his wife's motives. Unfortunately, Mr. Corbett, a simple confession from your wife is not enough. All she has to do is take back her words, and then her guilt will be refuted. Claims based on treason are often difficult to prove. But she told our daughter about it too. These are two witnesses, right? How old is your daughter? Fifteen. And you really want your daughter to testify against her mother? Harrison lowered his head. He was disappointed and realized that he had said something stupid. No, of course I don't want to, he answered bitterly. The lawyer smiled good-naturedly. Mr. Corbett, if both parties agree, divorce is a fairly simple procedure. But if not, the state is doing its best to make it a long, frustrating, and expensive process. If you can convince her to agree, the period of separation can be reduced to six months. Moreover, you can even live under the same roof if you comply with the condition. 
do not live as husband and wife, that is, without intimacy. But without her consent, I'm afraid you'll be stuck for two years. Thank you, Mr. Gilman, Harrison said, standing up and extending his hand to the lawyer. It seems like I need to think it over again. That's a good idea, Mr. Corbett, Stan agreed, shaking Harrison's hand. And maybe you should consider family therapy. From what you've told me, your wife seems truly remorseful. And considering that you have a 15-year-old daughter, maybe it's worth a try. Harrison realized that the lawyer was just trying to be helpful, but he was there to learn how to end a marriage, not how to save it. I'll think about it, he replied politely. Um, here's my business card, Harrison added, taking the card out of his wallet. Just send the invoice to this address. We do not charge a fee for consultation, Mr. Corbett. The first meeting is always free. This was the first good moment during the entire consultation. Harrison thanked the lawyer again and left, thinking about how to persuade Laura to get a divorce. The next day was Saturday. Harrison arranged to pick Ashley up in the morning so she could spend the weekend with him. On the way to the house, he wondered whether his life would now be reduced to the fact that he would live alone and his daughter would come to him on weekends. This is clearly not the life he once imagined. Having arrived at the house, Harrison did not want to see Laura and therefore left the car running, simply honking the horn. A minute or two later, Laura came out onto the porch. Ashley will be ready in a few minutes, Harrison. Will you come in? Would you like some coffee while you wait? No, it's okay. I'll wait here, he responded. He noticed Laura's face fall. A few minutes later, Ashley came out onto the porch. Dad, Please come in and help me with one thing, she asked before disappearing into the house. Harrison sighed, suspecting that this was some kind of ploy created by Laura and Ashley. He really hoped that Laura would not try to manipulate him through her daughter. He doubted that Laura was capable of this, but he didn't think that she could cheat on him at all. Reluctantly, Harrison got out of the car and headed into the house. Surprise! Both women shouted as he crossed the threshold and it really was a surprise. With all the worries of the last few days, Harrison had completely forgotten that today was his birthday. A large banner reading, Happy Birthday Harrison, hung across the hallway, and a cake with lit candles sat on the coffee table. Laura and Ashley stood next to the cake, smiling and holding brightly wrapped gifts. For a moment, the weight that had been weighing on his heart for the last few days seemed lighter, and a smile appeared on his face. Happy birthday, Dad, Ashley said. Happy birthday, Harrison, Laura added. He opened his mouth to say something, but no words came out. He was amazed by their unexpected gesture. I, I don't even know what to say. Thank you. Come on, sit down, Laura said, motioning him to the sofa. I'm blowing out the candles. When he sat down on the couch, Ashley hugged him and gave him his first gift. He unpacked a beautiful book about the early history of the Wild West. Thank you, honey, Harrison said, hugging his daughter. And this is from me, Laura held out an envelope wrapped in gift paper. Harrison looked at Laura, the same woman he had loved for so long. The anger subsided a little, but the pain remained. He slowly unwrapped the gift and pulled out two tickets from the envelope. Second City, he asked, surprised. Yes, I hope you didn't have anything planned for the evening. I thought. That you and Ashley will have fun, Laura said with a forced smile. I don't have any plans. I completely forgot that today is my birthday, he answered thoughtfully. These tickets were probably expensive. How were you able to afford this? I got a job as a waitress at the Mama Bee Cafe. It's temporary until I find something better. But to be honest, the tip wasn't bad and the tickets weren't that expensive, Laura replied. Can we go, Dad? Ashley asked. I've always wanted to see Second City. Of course, honey, he said, looking at his daughter's smiling face. Wonderful, Laura said with a big smile. She was pleased to give him the tickets. She saw it as a positive step in the right direction. Well, how about some coffee and a slice of cake? Okay, he agreed, nodding his head. It was almost like being a family again, Laura thought as they all sat enjoying the cake. Harrison joked and Ashley laughed, 
something Laura hadn't heard in a long time. Watching the interaction between her husband and daughter, Laura felt the faded hope come alive again. It's time to go, honey, Harrison said, finishing his cake. They headed towards the door. On the way out, he thanked Laura for the party. She almost sang with optimism as she cleared the table. But picking up one of the napkins, Laura noticed an envelope underneath it. She opened it and looked inside. There were tickets there. Laura rushed to the phone to call her husband before they drove too far, but Harrison's phone went straight to voicemail. Damn, thought Laura, how could he forget the tickets? She expected Harrison to call her later in the evening, but her phone had been silent all weekend. Around five o'clock on Sunday evening, Laura heard them return home. She went out to meet them, but Harrison stayed in the car while Ashley, taking her bag, kissed him on the cheek and ran to the porch. Do you want to stay for dinner, Harrison? She shouted. There is enough food for everyone. No, thank you, he replied, and without saying goodbye, he left. Laura was disappointed. She hoped to continue on a positive wave, but, hugging her joyful daughter, she asked her a question. Well, dear, did you like it? Oh, yes, Second City was absolutely amazing. Dad and I had a great time. Mom, you won't believe it, but Dad bought us new tickets online. Laura raised her eyebrows in surprise. New tickets? But he left the old ones here on the table. I tried to call him, but he didn't answer. Is it true? Well, he just bought new ones, and we had a great time. Now I'll go upstairs and unpack my things, Ashley said, going into the house. The joy Laura felt earlier instantly disappeared. Tears clouded her eyes. Her daughter's story made her understand that Harrison did not forget the tickets he left them on purpose. It was a cruel act, completely out of character for the loving man she knew. Was his heart really that hard? Have I really destroyed the person I love? She thought, and tears flowed down her cheeks. For Harrison, this weekend was just the first in a series of wonderful weekends that he planned to spend with his daughter. Ashley became the only bright spot in his life, while the rest seemed boring and monotonous. Even the work that previously brought him satisfaction has now turned into a routine. Almost four months had passed since he left home, and the thought of the two-year separation required by law seemed unbearable to him. He couldn't imagine living like this for another two years. Meanwhile, another problem was unfolding at home, one that Harrison was not yet aware of. Ashley became increasingly irritable and rude to her mother. Her initial shock and sadness gradually turned into anger, and she was not shy about showing her contempt. Over the past month, there have been a few snarky remarks, a couple of angry outbursts, and even a few fights. Laura knew she should stop this behavior, but she felt she deserved it, so she didn't try to stop Ashley. Around the same time that Harrison was contemplating his situation, Laura returned home from a double shift at the restaurant. She was exhausted, her legs ached from fatigue. Laura stopped in the hallway to take off her shoes and massage her feet. It was late, there was silence in the house, the lights were off, and she thought that Ashley was already asleep. Before going to bed, Laura decided to have a snack. The evening was so stressful that, despite the fact that she was working in a restaurant, she did not have time to eat a bite. She was terribly hungry. As Laura sat in the kitchen eating her sandwich, she counted her tip. $183 is not bad for one day, even a 16-hour one. She put the dishes in the sink and headed upstairs, but before she reached the stairs, she heard someone on the porch. At this late hour, she became afraid. Carefully approaching the window, she looked behind the curtain. In the moonlight, she saw two figures. At that moment, being exhausted, her brain did not immediately realize that it could be Ashley with someone. As soon as she realized this, her heart sank. Laura quickly turned on the light and swung the door open to face her. Ashley, come into the house immediately, Laura said sternly. Mom, Ashley exclaimed, close the door, I'll come in now. Now, young lady, come into the house immediately. Ashley looked at her boyfriend and smiled. See you tomorrow, she told him. He nodded and calmly left the porch. Laura noticed a certain smirk appear on her daughter's face 
as she walked past her into the house. Laura was filled with anger. What's happening to you? You stay late on a school night and don't say who you were with. And since when did you have a boyfriend? Laura asked indignantly. He's just a guy from school. We were with his friends. Don't worry, we didn't do anything. I'm not a woman of easy virtue like you, Ashley answered with a poisonous mockery. Laura was so stunned by her daughter's words that she only gasped in surprise. She stood still as Ashley went upstairs. Tears involuntarily welled up in my eyes, and my legs almost gave way from weakness. Laura sank onto the sofa and cried. Laura sat on the sofa in complete silence, tears rolling down her cheeks. She thought about how in two months her life had been turned upside down. She had lost her husband, and now her daughter was also moving away from her. The mistakes she made cost her everything. She didn't sleep a wink all night, lost in her dark thoughts. This morning, while preparing breakfast, Laura thought about how to talk to Ashley. She knew she couldn't let the conflict continue. Ashley, we need to talk about what happened last night, Laura began as they sat down to breakfast. Not now, Mom. I'm going to meet my friends before school, Ashley responded sharply. What friends? That guy you were with yesterday. Who is he anyway? Laura asked, trying to hide the excitement in her voice. Ashley stood up from the table without answering. Ashley, I didn't finish the call. Laura shouted, but heard the door slam behind her daughter. At that moment, Laura realized that she would not be able to work in this state. She was too upset and decided to call work and say that she was sick. She decided that she would spend the day at home, and as soon as Ashley returned from school, they would sit down and have a serious conversation. Harrison stayed at work late and then stopped at a restaurant for dinner. Returning to his motel room around 9 p.m., he was taking off his tie when the phone suddenly rang. He looked at the display and saw Laura's name. What does she want now? He muttered under his breath, dissatisfied with the call. Hello. Harrison, it's me. Isn't Ashley with you by any chance? There was concern in her voice. No, she's not here, he replied, immediately feeling the tension in the air. Oh, Harrison, I'm starting to worry. She's been acting strange lately. Yesterday she was on the street until midnight with some guy. What? Where have you been? Harrison interrupted her sharply, his voice filled with anxiety. I worked a double shift. When I returned home, I thought she was already asleep, but then I heard them on the porch. Harrison, I don't know what to do. She became so impudent and intractable. This morning she left without even letting me finish. I've already called all her friends, but no one knows where she is. Her voice trembled with fear. Harrison sighed heavily. You should have thought about this sooner before. He suddenly stopped, realizing that his harsh words would not help now. He heard Laura begin to cry on the other end of the line. Okay, calm down, he said softer, feeling a pang of guilt. Call the police. I'll go around the city now, check out the local cafes and teenage hangouts. If she comes back, let me know right away. Fine. Thank you, Harrison, Laura sobbed. Harrison quickly threw on his jacket and went in search. He drove around the area, looking into places popular with teenagers, asking questions, showing photos to his daughter. But no one saw Ashley. As time passed, anxiety grew. Around 12.30 at night, his phone rang. Harrison stopped the car and quickly grabbed his phone. Hello, he answered with hope in his voice. Harrison, it's me. She's back, Laura was sobbing, but her voice was noticeably relieved. God bless. Laura, this has to end now. His voice became firm again. Don't let her go to sleep. I'm leaving right now. Fine, I'll tell her you'll be there soon, she replied. Harrison turned off the road and headed toward the house, his mind racing. He was angry at his daughter for her behavior, but at the same time he understood that the root of her behavior lay in the pain and anger caused by her mother's betrayal. He knew he had to deal with this situation before it got out of control. Arriving home, he noticed that Laura was already waiting for him on the doorstep. Where is she? Harrison asked gloomily, wasting no time. She's in her room. Maybe you can get her out. 
she doesn't open the door for me, Laura said quietly. Harrison quickly walked up the stairs. Approaching his daughter's door, he knocked. Ashley, open the door. I want to talk to you, he said calmly. Silence. Harrison knocked harder. Ashley, open the door, or I'll take it off its hinges. You know me, I'm not joking, he added in a more stern tone. A few seconds later, the door slowly opened to reveal Ashley standing before her father. Her eyes were red from crying. Good choice, Harrison said sternly. Now wash your face and go downstairs. We're going to Denny's and we'll talk there. When Ashley was ready, they drove to the cafe in silence. After ordering coffee for himself and tea for Ashley, Harrison finally spoke. What's going on, Ashley? Your mom says you're being cocky and that you were out until midnight with your boyfriend. I knew she would run to complain to you, Ashley snapped. But don't worry, Dad, I didn't do anything. I'm not a woman of easy virtue like her. Hello, Harrison didn't shout, but he spoke very firmly. First of all, you didn't come running to me like your mother did. When you didn't come home, she called to see if you were with me, and secondly, she is not a woman of easy virtue, and I never want to hear you call her that, do you hear, young lady? Okay, she said defiantly, then what do you call it? She had sex with another man, and now you are going to divorce her. His daughter's eyes began to sparkle again. I miss you, Dad, and it's all Mom's fault. I hate her. Ashley was fifteen years old, but in his eyes she was still his little girl. This situation clearly had a negative impact on her. Previously, she always obeyed her father. He prayed that she would listen this time. I see, you're going to punish her by disrespecting yourself. This is true? Ah, uh, no, I, she looked at her father, knowing that he was disappointed in her. Now a couple of tears escaped and flowed down her cheeks. He always knew how to keep things in perspective. Tell me how you feel after insulting your mother. What do you mean? How do you feel about yourself? Does this make you feel good? It's not that, Dad, it's what she did, she whined. That's what this is about, Ashley. First of all, I do not believe that you hate your mother, and if you do, then your hatred is completely misplaced. Your mother did a terrible thing. Sometimes good people do bad things, it happens. People are not perfect, not even parents. Our flaws make us human. From what you've told me, and from what I can see myself, not a day has gone by that your mom doesn't regret what she did. Your pain is as deep as mine, but she also has to deal with feelings of guilt. Well, she deserves it, doesn't she? If you can be mad at her, then I don't see why I shouldn't be mad at her too, Ashley growled. Dad, because of what she did, we are no longer a family, she said, her voice shaking with emotion. Some of the kids at school had divorced parents, and I always felt sorry for them. Now I will be one of them. I never thought this would happen to me. I used to think I was so lucky because my mom and dad loved each other, but now everything is ruined and it's her fault. Ashley, I understand that you are angry, but we can be angry at people and still love them. Honey, your behavior is only making a bad situation worse. Both your mom and I are worried about you. Be angry, but don't lose. Don't let this anger destroy you. Don't lose your self-respect by not respecting your mother. But Dad, you always said respect has to be earned. Don't you think that 15 years of loving and caring for you should earn her respect? He fired back. But Dad... Listen, Ashley, she's the same person who stayed up nights caring for you when you were sick, the same person who was there for you whenever you needed her, and the same person who always looked out for you, so that you have everything you need. She wouldn't do anything for you, and you know it. If the roles were reversed, she'd be the first one in your corner, wouldn't she? Ashley took a napkin from the table and wiped her eyes. Yes, she sobbed. Honey, sometimes people do terrible things, but that doesn't make them terrible people, and it certainly doesn't mean you just stop loving them, not if you really loved them to begin with. Ashley wiped the tears from her eyes, thinking about what her father said. Ashley, it's okay to be angry, but we both raised you to be kind, loving, and compassionate. Don't let your anger change that. Don't let this make you bitter, 
or you'll have to pay for her mistake for the rest of your life. Do you love your mother? He asked her point blank. Maybe. She hesitated for just a second. Yes, of course I do. Then let her know that you're angry about what she did, but also let her know that you still love her, honey. Okay, sorry, Dad. I'm not the one you should be apologizing to, Pumpkin. Ashley nodded her head and wiped her eyes again. I know. I'll tell Mom I'm really sorry. That's my girl, he said with a smile. And no more talking until late, he told her. She shook her head. No, no more, I promise. Okay, now you're hungry. Do you want some cake or something? She shook her head, taking a sip of iced tea. Harris saw that behind that handsome face, there was a question. What is it, dear? Dad, why can't you support Mom? You told me you still loved her. The question took him by surprise. Darling, my relationship with your mother is different from yours. When two people get married, they make promises and commitments to each other. Love is important, but it's not the only thing. Loyalty and trust are the basis of a family. A successful marriage, and when all that is lost, the foundation crumbles. It doesn't mean they don't love each other anymore, it just means maybe they shouldn't get married anymore. You'll never come back, right, Dad? He saw the moisture still glistening in her eyes. Baby, I don't want to push you away, but I honestly don't know. When they returned, it was already half past two in the morning. Laura heard them drive up and was already on the porch when Ashley kissed her father goodnight and got out of the car. Harrison watched as she apologized and then hugged her mother. He prayed this would be Ashley's last rebellion. Later that week, Harrison was still having trouble sleeping. Even with everything else running through his head, he was still worried about Ashley. By Friday morning, he could barely get out of bed. Dana looked at her boss, and she didn't want to tell him that he was wanted in Mr. Pritchard's office. Ken Pritchard was the founder and CEO of Marketing Specialist, Inc. He was also one of the three guys Harrison reported to. He was busy looking at something on his computer when Harrison approached so he gently tapped on the floor to ceiling glass window of his boss's office. Mr. Pritchard raised his head with a smile and motioned for him to enter. Have a seat, Harrison. I was just looking at some of your reports. As Harrison sat down, his boss turned away from the screen and looked straight into Harrison's face. What's happening? What? I don't. Bullshit, Harrison. You know exactly what I'm talking about. For the past month or two, your work has been mediocre at best. I'm not used to seeing such effort, or better yet, lack of effort from you. Whatever problems you have affect this company, and I can't let it continue. You're too good at your job to let bullshit like that slip through the cracks. What has upset you so much that you can't do your job? Harrison was demoralized. He knew that his work was not up to his usual standards, but to hear the man he held in such high esteem express it so bluntly was truly disheartening. I sorry, Ken, it's ah, uh, a few personal issues. Okay, look, I don't want to intrude on your personal life, Harrison, but I also don't want to lose one of this company's most valuable assets. If you don't tell me what's wrong, how will I know if I can do it help or not? Are Laura and Ashley okay? Yeah, they're both fine, it's just. He sighed. Well, I moved out of the house. I understand. Ken's voice suddenly took on a sad tone. I'm sorry to hear that, Harrison. I really hope there is nothing that cannot be resolved. You two always seemed like a truly loving couple. Thank you, Ken. I, although I don't think we'll get back together, I could forgive almost everything, but he really didn't want to put his problems on his boss. He thought he had already said too much so he stopped mid-sentence. Are you saying that Laura cheated on you? Harrison's face showed his surprise. He had no intention of divulging this information. This guy must be a psychic, he thought. Mr. Pritchard read Harrison's expression. That's the one thing most husbands can't forgive, he said, answering an unasked question. It's funny, but women are much more likely to forgive infidelity than men. Did you know that? No, but I didn't really think about it at the time. Although I'm wondering why this happens. Women are more emotional than men, 
one would think they would be less likely to forgive. I suspect it has to do with male pride. Oh, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying a man shouldn't have pride, not by any means. But I believe that there are cases when forgiveness is necessary, order, when a second chance is appropriate, but male pride prevents this, I know that this is exactly what happened in my case, he admitted. Your case, I don't understand, you and Joyce. No, not me and Joyce, he interrupted. Joyce is my second wife, me and my first wife, Monica. Harrison was stunned. I didn't know you were married before. Yes, we got married right after college. I was so madly in love with her that I couldn't see anything, but that didn't stop me from cheating on her. Cheat on her, Harrison blurted out, sitting in his chair. I thought you said she cheated on you. We cheated on each other, he admitted, but I was the first. Soon after I started the company, she began to develop faster than I expected. My father worked on the railroad all his life, but I had my own business. I was a decent-looking guy. I suddenly had money and had plenty of opportunities to sleep with beautiful women. I was reluctant at first, but after a while I thought, what the hell, I'm a successful entrepreneur. Why don't I have some fun? I didn't think about the consequences and how it would affect Monica if she ever found out. Harrison was shocked and disappointed by his boss's confession. This was the man he had always loved and admired. Ken, it's hard for me to imagine this. You just don't seem like that kind of guy, he said incredulously. Well, I learned my lesson, he replied sadly. Unfortunately, by then it was too late. When Monica discovered what I was doing, she took revenge. The difference was that I was careful. She rubbed my nose into it. She flaunted her affair, maybe going to couples therapy or something would have helped, but she backed me into a corner. She told both friends and business partners about her affair. I had no choice but to file for divorce. Why did she do this? Harrison asked. Yeah, Ken grinned, because she was hurt, hurt, and royally angry. She lashed out and I really couldn't blame her. I just wanted her to give me another chance. Don't get me wrong. Joyce is a wonderful woman, and I love her very much, it's just. He paused briefly and stared into space. Harrison saw the sadness in his eyes. I'll just never stop loving Monica, he continued in a quiet, regretful voice. Harrison had never seen his boss look so melancholy. Ken looked back into Harrison's face. Don't ever do that again. No, of course not, Ken. I, I had no idea. Well, it's not something I'm proud of. I don't tell everyone about this. By the time you came on board, I was already married for the second time. Anyway, he said, seeming to come back to life, I guess what I'm saying is, before you do anything, make sure that you've explored all your options, Harrison. Male pride is very important. You need to be proud of yourself, your work, your accomplishments, and your family. Just don't let that get in the way of your happiness, my friend. I won't. Harrison promised as he began to stand up. Sit down, I'm not done yet, Ken demanded. I'll tell you what, I want you to take a week off. Harrison didn't like the idea. Ken, I can. I won't take no for an answer, he replied, cutting Harrison off. Don't worry, I'll still pay you, and since I'm forcing it on you, it won't count toward your vacation, but I want you to still take the time to think it over. That's your forte, isn't it? Harrison could see that his boss was serious. I'll give you until the end of the day to make sure all the fires are put out. Then I want you to bring one of your guys up to speed and tell him that he'll be in charge next week. I want you to focus on your personal life and not worry about work, understand? Yes, I understand, he sighed. A week's vacation was the last thing he wanted. At least work distracted him, and he didn't have to think about his situation but as he thought about it more, he realized it was the right thing to do. Everything had to be resolved, one way or another. On his way home, he stopped at a restaurant. He worked right through lunch to make sure he didn't leave anything behind that could explode while he was gone. As Harrison ate his southern fried steak, he thought about Ken's story. Something he said continued to torment him. He cheated because he felt like a big shot. In fact, that's exactly what his wife told him. The words were different, but the idea was the same. 
It was still on his mind when he returned to his motel room, and then he remembered the book Laura had asked him to read. He walked over to the dresser and pulled it out of the bottom drawer. A stands for adultery. Just looking at the title brought back terrible memories of the night she told him about it. He wanted to throw the book in the trash, but he stopped, took out a beer, and, settling down on the bed, opened it to the first page. Like the former owner, he found it interesting and extremely educational. By the time he fell asleep with the book on his chest, he had already read the third chapter. The next day was Saturday. The book will have to wait. The weekend was for him and his daughter. The weekend was just like any other he spent with Ashley. He always planned something that would be fun for both of them. On Sunday night, he took her to a restaurant before taking her home. So, how do you and Mom get along? He asked. Better? Yes, I think we have come to a truce, she replied. But it was easier to be angry with her than to feel sorry for her. Harrison found this statement strange. I don't understand. What do you mean? She cries in her room almost every night. I hear it when I'm lying in bed. When I was angry with her, I thought, okay, be miserable, you deserve it. But now I feel sorry for her again, and it hurts. There seemed to be no end to the pain caused by his wife's selfish desires, he thought. His daughter's statement struck a chord with him. On Monday, he started reading the book again, but only got to the fifth chapter before closing it and putting it away. Everything was spinning in my head, a book, a daughter, a confession from a boss. Harrison took out his cell phone and called home. After the third ring, the answering machine came on, and he left a short message. Laura, I want to come and talk. Call me back and let me know when you are free, please. The second call was to his boss. Harrison, this better not be work-related, Ken grumbled. No, Ken, he said with slight amusement. I'm doing what you told me. I'm working on my personal problems. Okay, then, what can I do for you? When we spoke on Friday, you mentioned counseling. I was just wondering if you ever went that far to find a good consultant. Damn, Harrison, that was 30 years ago. Besides, I didn't even get that far. Like I said, she cut me off at the knees. But I'll tell you what, I'll call Terry Hector, our lawyer. Of all the people who work at this firm, I'm willing to bet that one or two will be divorce lawyers. They work with marriage counselors all the time, and I'll see if I can get a recommendation for you. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate it. Oh, Harrison, his boss said before he could hang up, I think you're doing the right thing. Thanks, Ken, but there are no guarantees. If she wants to give a consultation, I will agree. If not, then it's over. She'll go for it. I'm sure of it he said optimistically. When Laura returned home, it was almost eight o'clock. She was supposed to be home by six, but the restaurant was so busy that her boss asked if she could stay until the rush was over. She happily agreed. Mom, Ashley called from her room when she heard her mother in the hallway. Dad left a message on the answering machine. He wants you to call him. Laura froze for a moment in fear. Was it a scam? She wondered what exactly he said. How angry did he sound? Her hand shook as she reached for the play button, but she needed to hear him for herself. Laura, I want to come and talk. Call me back and let me know when you are free, please. And that was it. She had no idea. All she could do was call and pray. Harrison. He heard the hesitation in her voice. Hey, Laura, how are you and Ashley getting along? Much better, thank you. Everything you told her meant a lot. Okay, he replied. Listen, Laura, I've been thinking a lot about our situation. Laura closed her eyes. This is it, she thought. She took a deep breath and waited for the hammer to fall. Do you have time this week to sit down and talk in the evening? He asked. She silently let the air out of her lungs with a slight sigh of relief. At least he didn't tell me about it on the phone, she thought. She was still very worried. She needed to know what he wanted to talk about, but she was too scared to ask. Still, she needed to know. Well, I just got home, but you can come now. I'll put the coffee pot on. Okay, see you in about 20 minutes, 
he said and hung up without saying another word. Laura quickly made coffee and then ran upstairs to change clothes. What did Daddy want? Ashley asked as she saw her mom enter the bedroom. I'm not sure, honey. He will come to talk. Ashley heard the worry in her mother's voice, and it scared her. She walked down the hall and into her mother's room. She saw her mother put on a skirt. There were tears in her eyes. Mom, why are you crying? What did he say? Oh, honey, I'm sorry. He didn't say anything honestly. I'm just a little nervous, that's all. Please don't be afraid, Laura said, trying to console her daughter. Ashley didn't buy it. He's going to divorce you, isn't he? She shouted. I knew it, I knew it. Why did you have to do this? Why wasn't daddy good enough for you? She exclaimed in anger. Oh, honey, Laura replied, looking into her daughter's upset face. I, I don't know why I did it, but it has nothing to do with your father not being good enough. He is the best person I know. I, I'm so sorry, honey. It's a pity. Each tear that fell from the grieving young girl's eyes was like a stake piercing Laura's heart. She extended her arms, closing the distance between herself and Ashley. Oh, Mom, she hugged her mother and pressed her face to the soothing pillows of her mother's chest, as she did as a child. What are we going to do, Mom? She was crying. What will we do without Dad? At that moment, they were both convinced that Harrison would come and tell Laura that he was divorcing her. For about the thousandth time after her confession, Laura cursed herself for all the pain she had caused her family. They held each other, each looking to the other for solace. They were still hugging when they heard the doorbell ring. Listen, dear, Laura turned to her daughter, wiping away tears. Maybe it's not what we think. I need to go down and talk to him, baby. Try not to worry too much. I'll let you know what's going on as soon as I know myself, okay? Ashley nodded her head sadly and returned to her bedroom. She plopped down face down on the bed and waited. Hi, Harrison, Laura said as she opened the door. She forced herself to smile. You know, you don't have to ring the bell. It's still your home. Harrison forced a smile and confirmed her words with a nod. Where would you like to do it? Here, she said, pointing to the living room or in the kitchen. Everything is fine in the kitchen he replied, already heading in that direction. While pouring coffee, Laura spoke a little nervously and then joined him at the opposite end of the table. Harrison sighed a little before getting to the reason he was here. He couldn't help but feel a little uneasy. He still wasn't sure he was doing the right thing. Laura, I don't think you know how much you've hurt me. To this day, I continue to hear your voice telling me that you cheated on me, and every time I hear it, the pain begins again. I don't know how many times I've picked up the phone to call a divorce lawyer, but obviously I haven't called yet. He took a sip of coffee and continued. Part of me says it's over, you cheated, that's all. But there is another part of me that keeps saying, people are not perfect, maybe after 17 years of marriage, she deserves another chance. It took him a short moment to collect his thoughts. I read some of that book you gave me. You were right. It made me understand how people can sometimes end up in bad situations. It's still no excuse for what you did, he commented emphatically. Laura was on the edge of her seat when he stopped for another drink. He continued to walk back and forth. She still didn't know what awaited her when he stopped talking. What was he leading to? Is he going to tell her that he is divorcing her or not? It was real torture. Anyway, he resumed, if you're interested, I'd like to try counseling. Honestly, I don't know if I can ever forgive you, but I'm ready to try. Before Harrison could finish his statement, Laura completely lost her composure. Four months of worry, grief, remorse, and guilt had just turned into the first sign of real hope. This was more than she could bear. Laura covered her face with both hands and burst into tears. Ashley, who had been listening, unseen from below the stairs, rushed to her mother to console her. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, Laura bawled. I, I... She was too emotional to speak. She stood up and literally ran upstairs to the bedroom. What does all this mean? Harrison asked. I think she was so relieved, Dad. Before you came, 
we were both sure that you were going to give her the divorce papers. Oh, honey, I'm sorry. I should have said more on the phone. I'll go up and talk to her. Let her go, Dad. She's trying to stay brave for me, but she needs to let it out. Just give her a few minutes, okay? He looked at this daughter. All this forced her to grow up much faster than he wanted. Dad, do you really think we have a chance to be a family again? There's a chance, honey, but I'm not making any promises, he said, clarifying his answer. He still had doubts and didn't want to get his hopes up. If your mother wants to go to counseling. Oh, she's interested, Dad. Okay, he said, chuckling slightly at how his daughter took charge. Well, I'll try then, but there's a lot to work through before we can even begin to fix the situation, dear. I won't lie to you, it's unlikely. I know, but it's still a chance, right, Dad? This is how my mother and I see it. Yes, there is still a chance. Thanks, Dad, Ashley said, hugging him. When are you guys going to start? I mean marriage counseling. I'm not sure, honey. I don't even have a therapist yet. My boss will give me some recommendations, but the sooner the better. They talked some more, then Harrison left before Laura returned. His boss made three recommendations. Harrison checked them out online and, after two days of searching, called his selectmen to see if they would take his case. Teresa was a physician's personal assistant. She answered the call in a pleasant voice. Dr. Wexler's office, how may I help you? The conversation took about 20 minutes. After Harrison opened up about his wife's affair, Teresa asked some pertinent questions and wrote down the answers. She wanted to know if both sides intended to reconcile. Harrison told her his wife was almost desperate for it, but explained his reluctance. This raised a new series of questions. Was he involved with someone else? Was he still in love with his wife? Was he ashamed and forced into therapy by someone else? or was it just his decision? She then asked what other family members were involved, and of course, Harrison told her about Ashley. At the end of the conversation, Teresa told him that she would consult with the doctor and call him back later the next day, but she was quite confident that the doctor would take their case. The next day, Dr. Jane Wexler called to confirm her desire for a consultation. Mr. Corbett, the simple fact that you sought help from a psychotherapist tells me that you want to stay in your marriage. Tell me what you hope to achieve through counseling. Doctor, right now I just can't come to terms with the fact that my wife cheated on me. I, I guess I'm hoping you can show me how to forgive her. This was an honest answer. Okay, she replied. Before we schedule a session with you and your wife, she explained, I would like to see you both individually. Each session will last approximately one hour. After this, I will meet with both of you once a week. Please wait while Teresa will make appointments and set up a payment schedule for you. After that, the line went dead for a moment. Wow, Harrison thought, she's all business. He wasn't sure if this was good or not. After a few seconds, Teresa said hello. Once the details were worked out, she asked him to call Laura and make an appointment with her. For the first time in a long time, Harrison felt like he was achieving something, or at least moving in that direction. However, he still felt that this was unlikely. Laura thanked him sincerely when he provided her with the information and apologized for her earlier outburst. Because he was still on furlough, Harrison was able to schedule an individual appointment for later that week. He felt strangely nervous as he walked into the doctor's office. He suddenly realized the impact these sessions could have on his entire life. Teresa looked much younger than she turned out to be. Harrison guessed her age to be closer to 60. She asked him to sit down and fill out some paperwork, including insurance forms, before walking him into the doctor's office. Dr. Wexler was also a surprise. From their telephone conversation, he imagined a young, pretty woman, but in fact he guessed that she was about 50 years old. Her hair was dark and cut short, barely covering one side of her forehead. When she stood up to greet him, he decided that she was no more than five feet and had absolutely no breasts to speak of. She really had a nice smile and a friendly voice. However, she was able to make Harrison feel more comfortable from the very beginning. So, Mr. Corbett, 
you said on the phone that your wife had committed adultery. Do you know this for sure, or do you suspect it? Oh no, that's a fact. She admitted it, he replied. It's clear. Why don't we start with you telling me what led to her confession? Over the past months, Harrison's anger has gradually dissipated, leaving his pain and grief much more visible. As a veteran, Dr. Wexler noticed this immediately. She could see that he was a man who was deeply in love, but was very deeply hurt by the betrayal of that love. As the session reached the end of the hour, she realized it was a challenge. Of all the things that can be broken, the heart is the hardest to mend. Dr. Wexler was actually more optimistic after meeting Laura. Many women downplay the importance of their affairs. He just needs to get over it seemed to be their mantra, minimizing and ignoring the pain they had caused, but Laura was sincere in her remorse. They were discussing the book she had read and how it had helped her realize the seriousness of what she was doing. She told Dr. Wexler that telling Harrison about her infidelity was by far the worst moment of her life. She couldn't stand it and cried three times in the allotted hour. The doctor was confident that after the session Laura would be able to adequately answer her husband's questions, but can he dig deep enough to forgive her? No one but Harrison could answer this question. A week later, it was time for their first lesson together. Harrison was nervous, but Laura was just scared. She was afraid that she would say something wrong and hurt him even more than before. Dr. Wexler told her the same thing she had read in the book. Whatever he asks, don't even think about lying. It is impossible to restore a relationship with lies. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, was her only chance. As they both sat down, the therapist tried to create a peaceful atmosphere by briefly describing how she conducted the sessions. Teresa brought fresh coffee and placed it on a small table against the wall. When she thought everyone was ready, Dr. Wexler got to work. Mr. Corbett, during our first meeting you asked me a question that bothers you almost as much as your wife's affair itself. Do you know the question I'm talking about? Yes, I think so, he replied. Well, she continued, I think this is a valid question and should be addressed from the beginning. Why don't you ask your wife? Harrison turned to a very concerned Laura. Why did you have to rub my nose in this, or was it just to ease your conscience? Sorry, Harrison, I don't understand what you mean. I didn't rub. Why did you have to say anything? He blurted out, interrupting her. Why couldn't you just break up with that idiot and say nothing? I had no idea. I didn't even know you were having an affair, he said through clenched teeth. He could already feel his anger rising to the surface again. Unconsciously, he raised his hand into a fist, trying to control his rage, and spoke again. Couldn't you just remain silent, he growled. I would have remained blissfully unaware and none of this would have ever happened. Laura's tears were already beginning to appear. I couldn't let you find out on your own, she muttered. Harrison, telling you what I did was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. God, how I wish I could say nothing. To this day, I sometimes wonder if it was the right thing to do, to ease my conscience, believe me, it would have been much easier to live with the mystery of what I did than to live with the consequences. I still don't understand, he said irritably. You were afraid that I would find out and tell you, this doesn't make sense, Laura. She saw that his face was still contorted with pain and anger, just like that night. Harrison, read chapter 12. No, Laura, Dr. Wexler interrupted. He needs to hear it from you and not read it from some book. You have to make him understand. Laura was depressed by the doctor's reprimand. She was under the mistaken impression that the doctor would be on her side in all this. She was upset. The book explained things much better than she could. How could she make him understand? It was so important, she had to make him understand. Harrison, do you remember what you said to Ashley the night you left? You said that marriage is built on trust and respect. Well, I broke your trust and disrespected you as my husband by cheating. How could I ask for your forgiveness? How could I prove to you that I could be trusted again if I continued to keep secrets from you? Laura took a tissue from the box on the doctor's table and wiped her eyes before continuing. Harrison, you are a very smart person. 
it will only be a matter of time before something catches the attention of your analytical mind and sooner or later you will realize it. When that day comes, and I only confessed to this affair after I was caught, if only then I told you that it was already over, would you believe me after that? Would you ever trust me again? Harrison, I started there as a secretary. I worked hard and gradually moved up the career ladder. It took nine years. Star Temp has a total of 65 offices across the country. Do you know how many of them are run by women? Two, and I was one of them. For me, I was like the CEO. I worked and reached the top, at least within our office. I felt successful, she said with pride in her voice. I know, Harrison interjected. I congratulated you, remember? I took you to a fancy restaurant to celebrate. Obviously, this was not enough. I should have paid more attention. Harrison, please stop blaming yourself. Of course I remember everything you did for me. You were wonderful. You and Ashley surprised me with balloons when I got home on my first day in my new job. You bought a bottle of champagne when you took me out to dinner. Darling, you have always supported me. Stop trying to put the blame on yourself. It's entirely mine, my fault, she repeated, now with a hint of anger in her voice. She found it difficult to control her emotions, admitting her own greed and trying to put it into words. Harrison, at home I was a wife and mother, part of the family, but at work I was the boss. I had power and prestige. Subconsciously, I wanted to maintain this feeling outside the office. Brad was our biggest client. I was the one who attracted him. Maybe that's why I got promoted. One of my first steps as a manager was to invite Brad to lunch at the company's expense. I had no intention of sleeping with him. I just enjoyed my new role. Harrison, when I put my corporate card on the table to pay for a $40 lunch, I truly felt like a CEO. Her voice rang with excitement. And then Brad started telling me things to boost my ego even more, about how much I deserved the promotion and how he wouldn't be surprised if I was offered something at the headquarters level in the future. Now I understand that he was simply seducing me, but then I took it for granted. Laura wondered if she was explaining everything correctly. She didn't want to appear making excuses or softening her guilt. It didn't take long before it all hit me. It soon became obvious that Brad wanted to sleep with me, and the more I got used to the idea that I was the boss, the more I began to think that I deserved something more. After all, don't male executives get a little on the side? That was my logic at that moment. I thought that I was no worse than a man and therefore had the right to the same pleasures. Harrison, I actually gave myself permission to have an affair. As Harrison listened, he couldn't help but draw parallels between his wife's story and his boss's. He shook his head in disbelief at their resemblance. I didn't see it, he remarked. I didn't notice anything. You would think that after 17 years of marriage, I would have noticed at least some changes. Something, even a hint. Harrison, when I was home, I felt the same as always. I still felt like a loving wife and mother. I highly doubt there was any noticeable change in my behavior or mood when I was with you and Ashley. I didn't turn into a boss lady until I was in the office. It was, I don't know, like Superman when he walked into a phone booth. Harrison chuckled slightly at her comparison, although he still didn't fully understand it. He also moved up the career ladder and became a boss, but he never felt like that. But no matter who you were at work, he continued, feeling his anger rising again. That didn't give you the right to betray me, betray the us, damn it. Have you had other novels? He asked sharply. Honestly, be honest with me, were there other men? His posture became tense, his face took on a stern expression, almost accusatory. No, please, Harrison, you have to believe me. Besides Brad, I haven't been with anyone else since we met. I don't have to believe a word you say, he muttered loud enough for both Laura and Dr. Wexler to hear. Mr. Corbett, usually with every betrayal it becomes easier to do something wrong. Do you feel like your wife has admitted to one affair, but is hiding others? He knew Laura was telling the truth even before the doctor said anything. He said this because he still couldn't quite shake the urge to stab her like she had done to him, and it worked. The tears she had been holding back were now streaming down her face. 
I know, he muttered. I just wanted to hear it from her. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw his wife again wiping her tears with a napkin. Mr. Corbett, I almost wish you had read this book because it seems to have given you some preconceived notions about wine. After what Mrs. Corbett said, do you still feel that in some way you are also responsible for her betrayal? Don't know. I keep thinking that if I had been more attentive, if I had noticed any changes in her behavior or mood, perhaps I could have prevented this before it happened. Would that make a difference? Harrison knew what she meant. The intention to do something wrong is just as bad as the act itself, but there were other factors. At least I wouldn't have to think about how I look compared to Brad. She says he wasn't as good as me, but how do I know she's not just saying that? If we made love again, how would I know that she doesn't compare me to him? That she doesn't think about him? Oh, Harrison, Laura began to cry again. I'm so sorry for everything I've done to you, for everything I've put you through. Dr. Wexler saw Harrison take a deep breath and then let it out loudly. He looked tired and depressed. She looked at the clock on her desk and was surprised to find that their session had already lasted ten minutes longer than expected. Okay, she said. You both look emotionally drained and our time is up, so we'll call it a day. Would you be okay with meeting at this time next week? They nodded their heads in unison. Okay, confirm the time with Teresa when you leave, the doctor asked. She didn't have any special instructions for Laura this time. She was more worried about Harrison. It was obvious that he was still suffering, and although he tried, she knew that he was not yet ready for reconciliation. The next few sessions went pretty much the same way. Harrison asked questions, and Laura answered them honestly and emotionally. Five weeks into the sessions, Laura had an announcement. Before we start, she said, sitting down, I want to tell Harrison something. Both Harrison and Dr. Wexler looked a little puzzled. Continue, the doctor replied. Laura turned to her husband with concern on her face. I just passed the exam and got my realtor license, she said. I don't know how you'll feel about this if you decide to come back to us. I want you to know that if you don't feel comfortable with it, I won't do it. Your return is the most important thing to me, so if you have any doubts, now or in the future, just tell me and I will leave. This came as a surprise to Harrison. He had no idea that Laura was going into real estate. What? Ah, uh, I? Why real estate? He finally asked. Valerie suggested this to me when I quit my job. She helped me get ready. She has a broker's license and I will work for her. Laura watched Harrison think, but his thoughts were not about what she was talking about. Her statement raised another question in his mind. Did Valerie know what you were doing? He asked suspiciously. No. I confessed everything to her only before I quit. I wanted to get her opinion on whether I should confess to you, although she didn't think I should. At first Harrison said nothing. He considered her words. Are you sure? Are you absolutely sure that Valerie didn't know about your betrayal? No, absolutely not. Nobody knew about this. In fact, Val was so angry after I told her that I thought she might stop communicating with me. So the only people who knew about it were the three of us, Valerie, and that idiot, of course. Mr. Corbett, please refrain. Sorry, he replied, interrupting Dr. Wexler and her rebuke of profanity. There's one more person, Laura said, correcting him. Katie, my assistant. I told her why I was quitting. That's all. Okay, he said, seeming satisfied with her answer. Then why do you think I might have a problem with you working with Valerie? It's not that I work for Valerie, it's that I work in real estate. I will have a lot of free time. I will go to open houses and meet with clients to show houses. If you return... I know you will be suspicious. It's natural. How do you know if I'm actually showing a house or meeting someone? Yes, I understand what you mean. Well, I'm not back yet. I think we'll deal with it if and when it happens, he said. Harrison clearly didn't want to deal with this new problem, but Dr. Wexler saw a potential threat to the future relationship. Mr. Corbett, how would you feel seeing your wife go out to show the house? She asked. I don't know he replied. 
These sessions should help me forgive her, and I hope they will help me trust her again. Honestly, if I can't trust her, I don't see any way for us to get back together, he sighed. In fact, Mr. Corbett, forgiveness and trust are something I cannot give you. Only you can find the strength to do this. These sessions simply open up the opportunity for communication between you and your spouse. Through this communication, perhaps you can find your way back to each other. The doctor broke the brief silence again. So, do you think you can watch her leave without feeling uneasy? Harrison looked at his wife's worried face. He remembered everything she had done, quit her job, confessed, although she could not have done it. He remembered how worried she was about Ashley starting to rebel and the genuine regret she had shown every day for the past five months. Could she have gone through all this if she didn't truly repent? If she didn't really love him? I don't think I'll have a problem with that, he replied. I know someone who is just as confused as Laura. He also cheated on his wife. It was a long time ago. He told me that he has never cheated since then, that he learned his lesson. He looked at his wife for a moment. I believe him, and I believe Laura when she says she'll never do that again. Laura's surprised expression showed the doctor that she was about to jump to conclusions. Oh, Harrison, so you're coming home, she exclaimed joyfully. Dr. Wexler understood his answer even before he said it. One stage has been passed, she thought. There is one more left. Even if he feels like he can trust Laura again, he hasn't said anything about forgiveness yet. No, I'm not going back yet, he told his disappointed wife. Laura's body, filled with hope for a moment, sank back into the chair with a feeling of disappointment. I need more time, Laura. Even if I think I can trust you again, that doesn't mean I've forgotten what you did. Laura nodded, understanding, but not hiding her displeasure. For a moment, she actually thought that her husband would return. I should have known, she thought, after what I've done, it can't be that simple. And she was right, it wasn't easy. After four more sessions, despite their productivity, there was no more talk of Harrison returning home. Dr. Wexler was beginning to doubt her success. Harrison simply couldn't let go of his pain, and until he did, reconciliation would be impossible. Harrison wanted to return home, but the thought of his wife's betrayal still hurt him. He looked for signs, trying to find something that would help him make a decision. He even began to leave through the Bible, but, not being a religious person, he did not know what exactly to look for and did not find anything that would help him with his decision. On the eve of his eleventh therapy session, seven months had passed since he left home and family. He lay cross-legged on a hotel bed, watching a documentary about Abraham Lincoln on PBS. Just as the commentator was quoting the 16th president, I have always found that mercy bears more fruit than strict justice, Harrison suddenly became thoughtful. Laura's mood was depressed when she walked into the doctor's office and sat down. It seemed that after one dead end after another, the hope with which she began the sessions began to fade. Even Ashley, every time she asked her mother about the sessions, had already lost faith in her father's return home. Dr. Wexler was the first to notice changes in Harrison. She caught a slight liveliness in his gait as he entered. There was a slight note of joy in his voice when greeting him. Before sitting down, he walked to the table against the wall and prepared two cups of coffee, one black and one with cream and sugar. There was a confidence in his behavior that the doctor had not noticed until that moment. It seemed that he had come to some kind of decision and was confident in it. Here you go, he said, handing the plastic cup to Laura. Her face looked like she was defeated. She took the cup and quietly thanked him. Dr. Wexler was sure that he had made a decision, but what it was, she did not know. Well, there's no point in dragging this out, she thought. Mr. Corbett, it looks like you have something on your mind, so I'll give you the floor, she said, leaning back in her chair. Harrison nodded to the doctor and then turned to Laura. Laura, I know I don't need to tell you how much you hurt me. We have discussed this more than once at these meetings, but I want you to know that despite all the pain and anger, I never stopped loving you. From the moment I first left home after you confessed to cheating, I searched my soul for answers. I weighed a lot of things, our daughter's well-being, the 17 years we'd invested in each other, 
my boss's experiences at work, and his words about not letting pride stand in the way of happiness. Of course, I took into account my own feelings, pain and anger, but also my love for you. Laura listened carefully, but after having her hopes dashed several times, she decided not to give in to them. Your actions after you broke up with him convinced me that you would never do it again, and one wise man told me that mercy sometimes bears more fruit than justice. I want to go home. I want us to raise our daughter together and put this all behind us. What do you think about this? Laura couldn't believe her ears. She closed her eyes, enjoying his words. Tears flowed from under her eyelids and streamed down her face. Her chest began to rise and fall with each sob. Without raising her head, she extended her arms, seeking comfort in his arms. He was there. He hugged her and gently held her head to his chest as she cried. Dr. Wexler, although she had a high success rate in reconciling couples, rarely saw such a scene in her office. She fought back her own tears. Harrison canceled the last meeting and followed his wife home. Ashley was sitting at the kitchen table doing her homework when they entered. Her eyes shone like lights when she saw them both smiling. I'm home, baby, he said with a big smile. Ashley jumped up and ran into his arms. Oh, daddy, daddy, she sobbed, hugging him tightly. Later that night, a naked Harrison climbed into bed with his equally naked wife. I, I'm a little nervous, she whispered. Why are you nervous? It's a, uh, she sighed. Isn't it too early? You understand. Harrison understood perfectly well. He asked himself the same question. Did he truly forgive her or was he just deceiving himself? Will he be able to make love to her again, for real? Laura continued to say, I... I want you to make love to me. I want you to show me that you have truly forgiven me. I, I want you so much, honey. Please, what do you think? It's HH, he whispered. Laura felt her heart beating with frantic desire. Silently, she prayed, thanking God for the second chance and vowing to never ruin their relationship again. It took almost two months before his wife and daughter stopped treating Harrison like a king and began to see him as an ordinary person again, but eventually life returned to normal. About eight months after Harrison returned home, Ken called him into his office. Harrison didn't even have time to sit down when Ken started saying, Harrison, I've created a new position Vice President of International Operations. As a perceptive person, Ken immediately knew what Harrison was thinking. They didn't have international operations, did they? He laughed when he saw the puzzled expression on his best employee's face. Yes, yes, I know, it sounds strange, doesn't it? But with a little luck and the right attitude, this title could be the future of our company. Now Harrison was even more puzzled. Ken continued, You've probably heard of Sean Craig, the actor. Yes, sure. Well, he's starting a chain of restaurants. He's currently thinking about seven restaurants here in the U.S. and two in Canada, but if they're successful, he wants to franchise them around the world. We are one of the companies he considers for location scouting and market analysis. If we can secure this contract, it could bring in millions. Wow, Ken, that's fantastic. Yeah, but you haven't heard the best part yet. Harrison was looking forward to the sequel. I am appointing you as the new vice president. Ken continued. Your new business cards are already being printed. Me? Ken, I. Uh. Wait, guy, there are nuances here. I knew it, Harrison thought. You are our best salesman, without a doubt. I want you to take your best assistant and go to Los Angeles next week. We're counting on you to secure the deal. If not, I won't take your title, but it won't mean anything, and you'll go back to your regular job. If you succeed, it will be your project. Sean Craig will be your only client, and we will create a great compensation program for you. Harrison knew this proposal was unusual. Ken, I don't understand why you don't wait until I have a contract to give me the position. Because I don't want to send out a simple project manager. I hope Craig will be impressed that we are sending the vice president to negotiate with him. Yeah, Harrison said indicating that he now understood the plan. It took Harrison five trips to Los Angeles, 
but he eventually returned to Chicago a winner, selling his firm as the best candidate for the job. The entire team greeted him with applause and praise, including his loving family. Over the next six months, Harrison and his team completed all the preliminary work and, along with Sean Craig and his team, selected the first seven locations for his restaurants. Harrison had just returned from Los Angeles when he was called back into the boss's office. Ken congratulated him on a job well done before moving on to the reason for the meeting. Harrison, does the name Brad Griffin mean anything to you? Just hearing his name, Harrison felt a chill inside. His whole body tensed, and he was forced to force himself to breathe in air. Yes, he muttered through clenched teeth. This is the bastard who slept with Laura. What? I thought so, Ken replied. Have you ever wanted to get back at him? Are you kidding? Constantly. But I didn't want to go to jail. Ken looked at his best vice president and said in a slightly sinister tone, Do you want revenge? Harrison looked at the boss. He would not have asked such questions if he did not have something on his mind. What are you up to? Ken smiled in anticipation. Your friend seems to be a big risk taker. Do you know what he did with that temp company? Harrison shook his head. I know he was their biggest client, but that's all. He has entered into contracts with several major seasonal retailers. He hired employees through an agency and placed them in shipping departments. When the season ended, people lost their jobs, but Griffin immediately hired new ones for another company. In general, his business flourished. Well done, Harrison said sarcastically. And how will this help me take revenge? Ken grinned. Well, now your old friend has his sights set on a bigger fish. He expects to win a contract to supply Sean Craig's restaurants. Harrison sat up straight. Now Ken had his full attention. Griffin put all his resources into this. If he doesn't get the contract, he will go bankrupt. His entire game rests on this one project. Basically, if we take the contract away from him, it will collapse. Harrison couldn't believe his ears. Now he smiled widely. Can I make this happen? Ken nodded. One call and he'll lose the contract. Do it, Harrison said without hesitation. Ken looked at him carefully. You sure? I never saw you as a vindictive person. Will you be able to sleep peacefully at night if we do this? Like a baby, Harrison replied. Look, I know Laura was just as guilty as he was, but that bastard almost ruined my life and my family's life. He knew she was married, but he didn't care. All he wanted was to get her into bed. He didn't think about who he was hurting. Okay, then consider it done, Ken said, nodding in agreement. Harrison was about to leave when he suddenly stopped and turned to Ken. I want him to know it was me, he said. It won't work unless he knows it was my hand that destroyed him. Ken chuckled. Let's come up with a plan. Three days later, Harrison stood on Wabash Avenue in downtown Chicago. He entered the high-rise building and took the elevator to the ninth floor. After a few steps, he found himself in front of a door marked Brad Griffin, Inc. He grinned and entered. How can I help? Griffin's secretary, an attractive red-haired woman, met him at the door. Yes, I'm Mr. Jameson. I came to discuss a contract to supply food for Sean Craig's restaurant chain, he calmly replied. Yes, Mr. Jameson, you are expected, she replied, pressing the intercom button. Mr. Griffin, Mr. Jameson has arrived. Griffin's voice came from the speaker. Send him to me. Please come in, the secretary said with a smile. Would you like to get coffee? No thanks, I'm only here for a little while, Harrison replied. Before entering the office, he sent a prepared message on his phone. Griffin stood up from the table with a wide smile and extended his hand. Mr. Jameson, nice to meet you. Harrison stopped a few steps away from the man who had ruined his life. Sorry, my name is not Jameson. My name is Harrison Corbett, same as my wife, Laura Corbett, with whom you had an affair. Griffin's smile disappeared instantly. He removed his hand and made a face. What do you need? 
Get out of my office, he growled. At this point, the secretary interrupted the conversation, using the intercom again. Mr. Griffin, sorry to bother you, but someone from Sean Craig's team on Line 3 says it's urgent. Harrison chuckled. You better answer, it's important. Griffin looked at him irritably and carefully picked up the phone, pressing the button. After a few seconds, his face turned pale. What? You can't do that? No, wait. But I... He froze as the line went dead. Now Harrison smiled widely. Retribution is a bitch, isn't it? He said, turned around and left the office. As Harrison rode the elevator down, he felt a deep sense of satisfaction. It was almost like something out of a biblical story, he thought. I met the Prince of Darkness and defeated him. Yes, it's been three years since I made peace with Laura. There were many factors to consider back then, but family always came first. Honestly, at that moment I thought that I would regret this decision, but, thank God, everything turned out to be completely the opposite. Laura is successful in real estate. Valerie taught her a lot. Now she chooses when to work and earns much more than when she was a manager at Star Temp. Am I worried when she goes out to show the house in the evenings? To be honest, I have never been so sure of her fidelity as I am now. She has proven her devotion and loyalty time and time again. Ashley is leaving for college soon, only a month left. We are immensely proud of her. I'm still VP of Worldwide Operations, but I don't have much work to do right now. My team works flawlessly and everything goes smoothly. Of course, one of the great joys of this situation, besides ruining Griffin, was that I became friends with Sean Craig. He is an amazing person and we have become great friends. It's always fun to watch Laura and Ashley fuss over him when he comes over for dinner. It's just comical. Ashley couldn't help herself and started bragging at school that Sean was her dad's friend. Of course, no one believed her, and she began to gain a reputation as a liar. When Sean found out about this, he offered to pick her up from school himself. He deliberately did this in front of as many students and teachers as possible. Since then, Ashley has become the most popular girl in school. There is another interesting story. A few months ago, Laura said she wanted to discuss something. It turned out that she wrote a book about her experience of extramarital affairs. No, not about sex itself, but about the consequences. She described her enormous feelings of guilt and shame. She spoke about the pain she experienced as she watched her family suffer, knowing that she was the cause of all their suffering. She described in detail her remorse and regret for putting us all through the worst period of our lives. She wanted me to read her book, but I couldn't it was too hard. She asked how I would feel about herself publishing it. She knew it wouldn't make much money, but she wanted others to feel our experience, hoping it would save at least one person from destroying their family in the same way. I gave my blessing on one condition, all the money she made would go to Ashley's college. Laura happily agreed. In the first month, the book brought in only $300, but in the second it brought in more and its popularity continues to grow. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. 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 Click to the next 